humans, you have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. You are my treasure, you are my treasure, you are my treasure, well you, 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 you are, Streets of New Cabana, has a lot of treasures, cause they like treasure, yeah, 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 manna, 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 of any color. What's going on, everybody? You are watching slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. Ye old host, Jimmy Wong is here. I'm one of them. Hello. Ye young host, Josh Lequai, <laughs> is also here. Ball, bat, bang, <laughs> tee it up. Uh, how's it going, everyone? We are doing the big one. It's in the 99 Commander Review for the streets, the streets, the streets of New Capanna. <laughs> well, it is um, it is our last uh, Streets of New Capenna set review coverage episode. Ever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, most likely. We might talk about cards from the set, but it's yes. our last set review. Yeah, so we're yeah. going to be talking about tons of cards today. Really exciting stuff. This set is looking pretty great, and there's lots of things to discuss. Yeah, for sure. But before we get into it, we have to give a big shout out to our sponsors, channelfireball.com slash command. That is the affiliate link you want to use when you're ordering your Streets of New Capenna cards. Whether it's sealed product or singles, you're a Magic player, you are going to go order Magic cards no matter what we say or do. <laughs> Truth. Yep. So you may as well just use our affiliate link when you do it because you'll be simultaneously getting the cards you want for your decks and supporting the content you enjoy. Yep. Again, channelfireball.com slash command. And the cool, cool thing here is if you forget that affiliate link, you can just type in the code command at checkout and it will also apply it. Uh, we should also say Channel Fireball is hosting Command Fest Las Vegas, which is coming yeah. up. Yeah, it's June 10th through the 12th. Jimmy and I are going to be there. A whole bunch of members of the Command Zone team are also going to be there. People are asking us all the time how to get in games with us. Yes, how to actually meet us. We'll sign stuff uh, begrudgingly, of course. We don't like tampering with cards. Please, <laughs> we'll sign, like, you know, sleeves or, like, eyelids and mountains. Please don't have me sign any more Vidalcon Orders or Blood Moons. Yeah, our foil ones at yeah. that. Uh, but, yeah, it's a great chance to meet us as well as play games with us in person in beautiful, sunny Las Vegas. So check out those details. They're going to be in the show more box below. And you can just look up Command Fest Las Vegas, June 10th through this 12th. I'm incredibly excited, Josh. I can't tell you. Yeah, it's been years since we've been to one of these big live events, and we love them in the past. I'm sure we're going to love this one and have a good time. Hope to see you there. Yeah. Let's sling some spells. And one thing you will definitely see when you're there is Ultra Pro Product, because they are also our sponsor, and generally, they're just the place to go when it comes to getting your accessories for Magic the Gathering. When you're traveling and you need a deck box that is better to, 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 to not break, to not fall apart, you know, Ultra Pro is amazing satin towers. They got the play mats. They have everything that you need to make sure that you can actually safely travel with your collection. Yeah. Even if you're going from your house to the LGS, whatever it is, uh, check out Ultra Pro Product. You can go buy them at your local game store. You can also go to their new store. It's shop.ultrapro.com slash command, similar uh, affiliate link, and you can find tons of product there. I guarantee you'll find something that you will want at your table the next time you play when you check it out. Yeah, I'm really happy we have this affiliate link now because we hear from people all the time where we talk about a product, but at their local LGS, it's not available or sold out or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so shop.ultrapro.com slash command is a great place to go directly to the source to get those things you want because you do want a sort of theme i mean if i'm going to command fest i want my play mat my oh, deck yeah. box and my sleeves all the match because how cool am i going to look yeah especially if you're trying to show off and beat us in a game i would be very impressed if you had the whole setup i yeah. would be more impressed if you lost to us in a game yeah. though, <laughs> <laughs> and the last one is where the show is directly at patreon.com slash command zone we love our patrons we just revamped the patreon we have tons and tons of new things including chances free to play with us over spell table in case you can't make it to a live event like yep. uh, uh command fest Las Vegas, so make sure you check that out. We also shout out one lucky patron every episode, so this episode is dedicated to Bryant Whitney. Whitney. Bryant, you rock. We should say also to all the patrons who... Um, submitted their auditions for game nights thank you so much we got a ton of them uh, they're awesome so far we've there's obviously a lot so it's going to take us a little while to go through but we will be announcing on the podcast the winners uh, coming up it's probably going to take a number of weeks so don't get yeah. excited just quite yet just because there's so many to go through but we will be going through them and announcing that you know hopefully in the next uh, five to eight weeks is my guess yep so make sure you're subscribed to the podcast that's how you're going to find out uh and finally we have an online store shop.commandzone.com we have some stuff there if you want to check that out too Every link for everything we just talked about will be in the show notes. Okay. Okay. Main topic. This is going to be a big one. We are talking about the cards that go in your 99, so non-legendary creatures Lots from Streets of New Capenna. Well, enchantments, planeswalkers, all that stuff. Yep. Um, we will not be covering any of the legendary creatures, and we're not going to talk about the stuff from the Commander product. So this is just the main set, or there are some things that are only available in set boosters. They do that now. Yep. We will let you know when we get to those cards. Yep. So... Um, 
Oh, and we're not going to cover the new mechanics in the set. We did that in episode number 458. So if you want to know how each of the new mechanics work, yep. that's the episode to go to. Okay. Okay. So we have cycles first. We always talk about the big cycles in the set. The first one is the ascendancy cycle. This is tied to the five families on New Capenna. So you've got all these three color combinations. It's very similar if you're playing of Cons of Tarkir time to the Jeskai ascendancy, Abzan ascendancy, Abzan ascendancy, and all that stuff too. Yeah. And I think people were excited because Jeskai ascendancy and a, a couple of those are very, very good. Yeah. But they vary in power level. Um, so there's one for each family. Yeah. I think there's one for each family, then one for each, what is that? Wedge, Wedge. from Cons. And then there's Simic ascendancy just hanging out there by itself. Oh, yeah, the only that's two right. Fantasy, yeah. Um, I will note, though, the all of these the mana cost is typically just the colors of the color identity. Yeah. These are... You, you have to have a pretty good mana base, I think, if you're in your three-color deck plus to hit these on turn three. Right. So and a just, lot of them aren't very good if you don't hit them on turn three. Right? Yeah, yeah. So that just keep that in mind as we go through them. All right. I'll read the first one. It's Cabaretti Ascendancy. Cabaretti. This is the Naya one. Uh, red, green, and white. So three mana, three mana value. Enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, look at the top card of your library. If it's a creature or planeswalker card, you may reveal it, put it into your hand. If you don't put the card into your hand, you may put it on the bottom of your library. Okay, so this is a three-color hard-to-cast, some kind of Phyrexian Arena that may not hit 37-plus percent of the time. More than that. How many... Right, yeah. Are, are, is every other card magic a creature or a Planeswalker? Probably not. I mean, you rarely see decks that are even 50 creatures and Planeswalkers combined, right? Yeah. That would be very high. Most decks are maybe around the 30 range, so one in three... Not even that. I would say less. Yeah. 25, 30, yeah. Those are creature-heavy decks can yeah, have yeah. 32 creatures and two Planeswalkers or something. Right. So, so like a third of the time, this is going to net you a car. It's just not worth it. I mean, we don't have to talk about it for too long. Right, yeah. like if you're playing a creature-based deck, so that's like Nikki of the Old Ways, which is literally the creature-based deck, or Chulain Teller of Tales. It's, I mean, one you can't play this in Chulain, right? But it's gonna be hard to cast this, and Nikki goes in the deck, so I don't really know what commander this goes with. Maybe like Merith or something. Yeah, but you can't play this in Nikia either. If you had a, like a five-color deck or a four-color deck that had Nikia and Chulain in it, yeah, so you, you are already playing a deck that probably has sixty-plus creatures. Yeah, because the highest you could ever get is about 67 creatures because you got to have some lands. Yeah, and look, I think you're only playing this card if you, one, have a ton of top deck manipulation, but even then, it's only creatures and planewalkers. There's tons of better options. So I think this is the card that sits at the standard power level slash good and limited. Yeah, I just don't think we're playing it in Commander. There's too many good card draw spells that will always draw you cards, and this is going to be a sometimes. Not to mention, it's really bad when you draw it on turn seven or eight, right? Yeah, actually, it's probably like not even that good and limited. Yeah. So. <laughs> this next one I think is a little underrated. Yeah, Obscura Ascendancy, your favorite of the families, Josh. Maybe that's why I think it's underrated. <laughs> White, blue, and a black for an enchantment. Whenever you cast a spell, if its mana value is equal to one plus the number of soul counters on Obscura Ascendancy, put a soul counter on Obscura Ascendancy, then create a 2-2 white spirit creature token with flying. And then as long as there are five or more soul counters on Obscura Ascendancy, spirits you control get three plus three plus three. So this starts off with zero. So you need to cast a one mana value spell like Ponder or Brainstorm. And then you get a counter on it. And then you need to cast a two mana spell to increase it. Well, the um, first time you get a counter, you do get a 2-2 two -two flyer. Yeah, yeah. And you get a 2-2 two -two flyer every time that you're able to ratchet the number up by one. And then yeah, when then you, you cast a two drop, get a 2-2 two -two flyer. Then you cast a three drop, get another 2-2 two -two flyer. When you get to five, all those 2-2 two -two flyers become five fives. And not just that, spirits. So if there's a spirit-based deck, obviously, that there's a little more exciting stuff there. Yeah, I think a lot of people are down on this card, but I actually think it's decent. Yeah. Yeah, because 2-2 two -two flyers are pretty good. You have to go th jump through some hoops to do it, but then they become 5-5 five -five flyers. I, I think also, like, a lot of these cards that you would compare to, they create, like, one token per turn, right. which is pretty bad when you draw it late, but this actually still has a chance when you draw it on turn 6 or 7 that you play it, go 1-drop, 2-drop, 3-drop, and still get your value, like, right then. Yeah, and now that your decks are, have, are very much more, you know, filled with 1, 2, 3-drops, that's not too inconceivable i do think that you do need to probably be slightly more in the spell slinger category you can't be you know because you, you're not going to always have that ponder brain because you get even getting this started late game i think you just need to, coin. to have a low curve which we tend to do these days it's not that yeah. surprising to have 15 one drops 20 two it drops. is nice that it's spell so you could even draw a late game soul ring and start this thing going too okay yeah, i see sure. what you mean now yeah and also i think it's being a little bit overemphasized that like eventually this will get to the point where it's not making two twos anymore because once you get to like seven you yeah. have to play an 8-drop. That's just most most games we we may not even cast an 8-drop. And definitely once you're at 8 or 9, what, are you going to cast a 10-drop? Like, no way, yeah. 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 It, so I think people are looking at it and being like, well, I can't get unlimited spirits out of this. But honestly, <laughs> compare it to like Bitter Blossom. How many Bitter Blossom fairy tokens does uh, a Bitter Blossom usually create in a game? I would say it needs to make 5 to 6 for me to be happy with it. And do you say, would you say that's a normal case for Bitter Blossom? Yeah, 
and it's unless you just draw it in turn six or seven and then you realize no I, i'd just rather do something else instead of waiting for my upkeep to make a one one so five or six yeah i think five or six is doable with obscure ascendancy and also like i said easier a little bit than bitter blossom if you don't have it in your opening hand and you draw it on turns four or five you could just then get it going yeah yeah because bitter blossom doesn't matter what you do if it's turn eight and you play it the yeah. game's going to only last a couple more turns and you're not going to get five or six fairies out of this this if even if you play on turn eight you could get you know, five at what would turn out to be five, five flyers. Out. There have been games where I draw like Wayfarer's Bobble, especially in oh, color yeah. combinations like this. And you're like, darn, this is like, that's going to thin my deck out. No, not really. But if you do happen to have Obscure of Tennessee and you get it going, then that becomes a, you know, a, a Wayfarer's Bobble with a two, two flyer. And that's actually, that's not bad. I would compare it a little bit possibly to like Luminarch Ascension. But <laughs> well, that's a bold comparison. It is, but if you, you Luminarch Ascension is very good. Two mana, create four fours, and it's pretty easy to turn that on, although it becomes yeah. worse late game when you are getting hit. Um, so sometimes Luminarch Ascension does nothing. Yeah. And normally I have v- seen very few games where Luminarch Ascension makes more than like four or five angels because that's usually just tends to be enough. Right. That like it's very powerful. So I think Obscura Ascendancy, you know, has... It's not the exact same, and I don't think it's quite as good as Luminarch Ascension, but it has some of those things going for it. I think it's better than it looks. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, there's another angle where maybe you're caring about putting and taking counters off, mm. but or proliferating. Proliferating. Proliferating is probably where I'd want to get to. I'd want to bl- play a Spirits deck, get to that five counter as soon as possible, and then you're you're swinging them for big game. That's a lot of damage. Yeah, the problem with Spirits decks are they don't tend to be three color. They're usually white and blue yeah so a spirits deck that has black is going to be a little bit tougher to uh to pull off you you probably can but that's not what spirit decks normally want to do but like power conduit throw parasite she says she says amazing actually because it is a spirit too yeah so she say these are all ways to take counters off so if you want to do a one drop two drop three drop take a counter off cast another three, three drop. drop yeah yeah take two counters off cast a two drop you could keep this going quote unquote forever yeah yeah so i i think you know there we're gonna see this a little bit more i think than think people think yeah, I, I, your deck probably has to have a couple of pieces that really want to move in this direction, but I like this. And don't forget, with Proliferate, you don't have to also add a counter. You could just be like, nah, I'm good. Yeah, I got a four drop in my hand. It's going to go to five. I don't need to Proliferate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Obscure Ascendancy, I prolifer- Proliferate my other stuff. Yeah. Nice. Okay, let's go on to the next one, which is Broker's Ascendancy. I had this in a draft once already, and it's broken yeah, in draft. Yeah, you played it against me. And I passed it, and I was in the uh, the broker's colors, and I was like, nah, no way, this is too slow. You played it twice, and every time I was like, oh, no. Yeah, this card's unbeatable. Oh, no. In limited. Yeah. It's still good, though, in, in Commander. I, it's, uh, sorry, Broker's Ascendancy. Green, <laughs> white, blue, so three mana for an enchantment. At the beginning of your end step, put a 1-1 counter on each creature you control and a loyalty counter on each creature planeswalker you control okay so lots of plus one plus one counters are running around in the band colors you have all your classics your conclave mentors hardened scales you name it there's a thousand different ways to use plus one plus one counters that's simic ascendancy simic ascendancy yeah yeah, coming to shine it's like i'm here boss (laughs) yep uh (laughs) yeah and i think that you know that's a no we don't have to talk about one one counters right because it's just a known quantity there's very many decks that do it so everybody that already has one of those and it's in these colors, I think this goes in there, right? If, yeah, again, y- you might have your bunch, you may be playing a bunch of Johnnies that do the same thing, in which case, Broker's Ascendancy is nice because it also takes your Planeswalkers up. Yeah, that's actually interesting. Although that it does do common. that on the end step, which is yeah. not super helpful. I think we... Shane Vale! Yeah. <laughs> no, now I think you're playing... The thing about these Ascendancies, they are... If we're kind of talking about them as if they were the commander, right. but you have to find the deck that they fit in. Yeah. If you're making too much of a stretch to do it, it's okay to pass it up. I yeah. passed up a lot of the cons, you know, ascendancies too. Yeah, you don't play these in decks and then change your deck to fit them. You look at your deck and go, oh, does it already have a lot of the cards Josh and yeah. you're talking about? Then maybe that goes in. Yeah, I think if you have like Teferi Master of Time and... Oh, Ar- yeah, because you can use the, the abilities a bunch. Yeah, and if you already have like Evolution Sage and Flux Channeler in, it probably is cluing you into the fact that you've got enough counter synergy or loyalty yeah. synergy proliferate to, to want something like this if you're in the colors. Yeah, but, do you play this in the Traxa? It is three colors that are in the Traxa. I think you probably do, right? Like you already want that ability. It's, it's kind of like proliferating and especially yeah. if you're attracted to super friends and i think you definitely would give it consideration all right what's the next one maestro's ascendancy this is grixis blue black and red enchantment once during each of your turns you may cast an instant or sorcery spell from your graveyard by sacrificing a creature in addition to paying its other costs if a spell cast this way would be put into your graveyard exile it instead okay so once during each of your turns once per turn you get a rebuy an instant or sorcery just by sacking a creature alongside it yeah it's like cast dissident mage but one additional hoop you got to jump through flash back refice flash back re- wow that's good <laughs> it does say once each turn too which i believe that um 
Kess does not say. So you can... Yeah, it says during each of your turns. Yeah, Kess says during each of your turns. Right. This says once each turn. So in some ways, more powerful. Each of your... Yeah, once each of your turns, though. Still has oh, the your in not, there. Oh, it's not... It's just like a weird word soup. The more words uh, they put on magic cards, the more we see this issue, I think. It's like... So it's not once each turn, it's once each of your turns. Yeah, uh, but, but... So it is Kess. Yeah, it is Kess, yeah. But rebuying spells is obviously very powerful. Does Kess want a redundancy of this? Probably. But does Kess have the creatures to sacrifice it? I don't know. Yeah, I think it's going to be good with recursion. Yeah. So you'll be able to do things like cast Dockside, sack uh, it, reanimate it, get it back. Every sack turn, the Dockside to get, get it back, yeah. The reanimate back to get the Dockside back. You could probably do things like that. Yeah. You could also play, cast Mold Drifter for its evoke cost. And if you have an instant spell in response to the evoke trigger, you can then sack the Mold Drifter before the evoke trigger evokes it. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's interesting. And get, yeah. So that's like a free spell, kind of. Because yeah. you're going to sacrifice that creature anyway. I think also like... These days, we tend to have a lot of little tokens running around that other people gave us. So you got Swan oh, yeah. Kong, Pongified, Beast Within. Those are creatures that are just, you know, expendable to you. Mm -hmm. And this is a way to turn them into whatever the best instant or sorcery is in your graveyard, which is pretty big game. And, and, and even just Mole Drifter, if you cast it at a certain point and then you got the Maester's Ascendancy, it already got its ETB trigger. So anything like that yeah. can just be kind of, you already got value, sack it, get an instant or sorcery back. Yeah, I think this card is pretty good just because we used to play our Kale Mancer, and that's a four mana version that you have to do it to, right? And you yeah, can't yeah. repeat it. This at least goes a bunch. And this isn't bad late game, too, because you can play this on turn eight, and you also, at that turn, you get the ability. You can do it that turn. And a lot of times you're playing on turn eight, be like, I'm going to sack this creature that's pretty good, but I'm going to get back my Demonic Tutor, my Vampire yeah, Tutor. Yeah. I'm going to get my Jessica's Will back. You know, yep. I'm going to get something extraordinarily, you know, game winningly powerful now that yeah. I used early for value. Even if you're like Toxic Deluge, fine then you don't care about sacking the creature because mm -hmm. you just have to get it back. So I, I, I could see this in Marchesa that has the buyback abilities for, you know, creatures and all that stuff. So it seems interesting. A lot of spell signal decks also have like Talrand or Young yep. Pyromancer to just incidentally create tokens that are just free fodder for this. So yeah, I think Maester's Ascendancy quite good. I mean, look, anytime I can play Jessica's Will or a Wheel again. of Fortune type or, you know, or, right? Like if you get to play those spells again, we always talk about Underworld Breach and that requires, I think, more setup probably because you need to be more graveyard focused. But Maester's Ascendancy just hopes that you have some small creatures around. So yeah, you got to be in a deck that's making creatures or can grab them or something. So maybe that can work out. All right. The last one is Riveteer's Ascendancy. I like how the Riveteers are just like having lunch. Yeah. This is modeled after a very famous yeah. uh, uh, photograph on top of, I think, the Eiffel... No, the, no, Empire, the, State the Empire State Building. Not yeah. the Eiffel State. Yeah. <laughs> the Eiffel State Building. <laughs> By the way, the Eiffel Tower, I think, was made in America and sent to Paris, right? Wasn't that the whole... Was it? I know that was the, it the other way Statue around? of Liberty was sent from That's French. That's what it was. Yeah, I don't think Ignore. we made the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, misinformation from me. It <laughs> was right. a trick question to see if you Look knew. Look it up, kids. And I'll Josh knew. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I passed. Yeah, good job. You have now, now you're on to the $2,000 millionaire question. <laughs> All right, Riveteer's Ascendancy is a black, red, and a green for an enchantment. Whenever you sacrifice a creature, you may return target creature card with less a mana value from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped okay john did john really need this hold on i'll do this only once each turn each turn this one does say each turn if you have a Vidalcan... wait no not on each you of your turns each order. turn yeah yeah you don't need a in order you do need to be able to sack things in instant speed not difficult to yes. figure out yeah 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 it feels like this one i mean once again i think Every set review from here until forever, we're going to talk about Dockside a lot of times because it's just so good with so many things. Mm -hmm. But here we go. Dockside, you sack it. This is a May ability, so you can not resolve the trigger and right. then like play a three drop flesh bag marauder or it something. It sacks itself. Oh yeah. my goodness. Get Dockside back. Get Dockside back. You know, th and then on the very next turn, if you have another three drop, you could just mm -hmm. sack it, you know, sack Dockside already, sack it again. You could get Dockside back on everybody's turn or something like that's not, yeah. a, it's not a hard scenario to figure out because it gives you so much mana to play the things that will you then sack to get it back. Yeah. Now, notably, Riveteer's Ascendancy is not a sacrifice engine itself. It right. just says when you sacrifice a creature. But again, we've seen this all the time. Jerry Master of the Review, uh, the, you know, there's tons of rewarding you for sacrificing stuff. Aristocrats decks, you can now buy back your two mana blood artist there's so many altars and goblin bombardments and Viscera greater Sears, goods and greater Viscera Sears good, yeah. and lands that do it just like it's so easy yeah. to sack creatures if you want to be able to do that you will i think a big thing you're going to want to do if you have this in a deck is have some creatures that sort of have a high mana value but you don't pay that amount to get them out oh yeah bingo so like 
Galta, Primal Hunger. Yeah, you're that's... playing that for like 5, 3 GG or whatever. But when you sack it, Riveteer's Ascendancy sees it as a 12 CMC spell. So you <laughs> can get back, you know, some very large, scary things. You can get back your shield rate or whatever. Yeah, Sign of Draco is another one that's going to cost way less, especially if you're playing a 5-color deck and it's all about sacrificing. Um, yeah, but even just in a, a Jun deck, it'll still cost 6. Yeah. And But when you sack it, it'll see it as a 12 CMC spell. I really like Bedlam Reveler. Oh, yeah. This is a, just a great value card for red, and you want it to actually... You're okay if it dies because it's it has its ability and it's trying to get you cards. You're gonna prowess it out or not prowess it. You're gonna co- it's gonna cost less for each instant or sorcery. You can play this for like two mana. It's an eight mana spell. Yeah, I think you get Bedlam Reveler out. You're gonna discard your hand and then draw three cards. That's gonna put something awesome in your graveyard. You're gonna sack oh, the Bedlam right. Re- yeah, Reveler part, yeah. and then get like your Shieldred or something back. You know, boom and you you know you're up cards there and then you could actually like maybe get bedlam reveler out again later yeah uh john is the sacrifice deck by the way you know uh, corvold is the biggest opponent or the biggest foe in this world so it, it makes sense but this is a very powerful spell because during once of each of your turns you can just wait till the next turn find a way to get your flashback marauder back make everyone sack at instant speed right you can really mess with people's turns because you can do this at instant speed as long as you have a sack outlet what else is really good is just evoke creatures. So if you oh, yeah, evoke something else, they sacrifice themselves. And there's all those new uh, Modern Horizons ones that you exile a you know a card that shares a color with it from your hand and put it out for free. Basically. And then yeah, and evoke. So it. now if you've gotten something into your graveyard, you can be like, boom! I'm going to cheat out grief and get the effect from it. It's going to get sacrificed because of the evoke, and then I'm going to bring back something else uh, out. And and I think the yeah. thing you bring back can be a thing that brings the grief or whatever back from your graveyard too. It could be Eternal Witness. It oh could yeah, be Cadaver Imp. Cadaver Imp. Yep. Yeah. Garner the Blood Flame seems amazing in a deck with this card because you might be able to be like sack, 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 sack. Get Garner back uh, garner brings right. all the stuff back get all the etbs again yeah th- this feels like just a super value engine yeah uh, and then there's the new blitz mechanic which makes you sacrifice the creature when they get blitzed in we talked about jaxus as a commander in the mono colored set review so i could totally see this working in a lot of different jun decks even that's the thing about jun is that you may not even care about what this is trying to do but you bam all of a sudden when you have this effect you're looking at five brand new lines to get you that dock side or whatever it is back and a ton of value on top of it yeah i think a lot of jun decks can just not think about it take one card out put riveteer's ascendancy in, <laughs> and, and during the course out. of the game you'll find a million ways to just be like oh this is gonna be awesome right now because i'm gonna sack this get this then sack that get that pass the turn do it again yeah pass the turn do it again and so yeah and i've always got something to bring back it's going from a four to a three the three buys me the two the two goes on the battlefield right like yeah value 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 yeah all right i think that is the best of the ascendancies at the river river tears one by far yeah okay there's another cycle it is the charm cycle now charms there have been a lot more than just con the cons ones in the past yep. uh, but these also are all instants or sorry these also are all three color mm-hmm. uh, and not also they are all instants yep as are, I believe, the old charms, too. And they've had charms in these colors before, like Esper Charm and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, all, also in comparison to the Ascendancies. But I think charms are always instants. Is that true? I, I think so. It feels so. like it's true. Yeah. Somebody double check that. Okay. It would not be very charming if they were not. <laughs> all right, the first one is Cabaret Charm. It costs a red, a green, and a white for an instant. You can choose one. Oh, yeah, all the charms are modal. They always have three choices, and you can choose one, right? Yeah. So the three choices on Cabaret Charm are it deals damage equal to the number of creatures you control to target pl- creature or planeswalker. Creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and gain trample until end of turn. Or choice three is create two one one green and white citizen creature tokens. Uh, too bad you can't choose two to make the tokens and then deal the damage. Yeah. yeah. So it's a raise the alarm. It is a sort of overrun type spell, and it is a clunky removal spell. Yeah, I really don't like the la- the first option on this it, you're gonna find moments when it, someone can re, you know they can remove a creature in response or you just don't have enough to kill that 10 toughness thing right they got so, a big thing and you got five creatures and this just, this just yeah. doesn't kill you're them. also in green and white you've got so many good removal spots that I, that right like if you're asking yourself is swords of plowshares better than this then you have to ask yourself do i really care about the overrun or the raise the alarm effect on top because if swords is just better then i don't think you're really running cabaret charm yeah, I don't think this card is very good. In dedicated token decks, you might run it, but uh, I don't think we're going to see it very much. Yep. All right, next up we got, is this your favorite? It's Obscura Charm, <laughs> a white, blue, and a black for an instant. Choose one. Pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it is. Return target multicolored permanent card with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Or counter target instant or sorcery spell. Or destroy target creature or planeswalker with mana value three or less. So it's conditional reanimate, conditional counterspell, and then conditional removal. Yeah, now now it's kind of like playing the balancing game, and I do think that this is probably worth it. It's close. I think you have to have enough three 
and two CMC creatures in your deck that you would want to reanimate that are quite good. Yeah, but at this point, is your deck not mostly filled yeah. with two and three CMC That's cards? not a high bar to clear. So yeah, I'm, it does have to be multicolored, so you can't be doing like your uh, oh, good you know, point, Blood actually. Artist and stuff. It has to be two colors. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't really thought about the multicolored thing, but that actually matters. I think, because how many do you need? 10 or so targets for it before that's, that mode really counts for anything for you? Yeah, unless, again... That's you, a lot. Yeah, unless you are just, you know that your deck is going to have the need to do so. Like, it's like, yeah, you can't even do like Thassa's Oracle or anything with it. So it does limit that first one quite a bit. Maybe if you had five, but they were very key yeah. to your strategy. But yeah, that makes it quite a bit worse, actually. I'm glad you said that. Um, the counter target instant or sorcery spell always going to be useful. That's probably the most likely to be used mode on the thing. Mm -hmm. But destroying a creature or planeswalker mana value three or less is a thing that will come up. And not, the fact that it hits three definitely makes it, if it was two or less. Yeah, it'd be, this would be very, very... Uh, but you can hit their Timnas and things like that, which are quite powerful and you want to get rid of. So I think True. this is playable, but it's going to be a little bit fringe. It's probably, you know what I feel like? It's going to be like your 73rd card most of the time. It'll get cut near the end. Yeah, it's tough to justify this again uh, because you are like, are you going to hold up three mana a bunch? If you do, I like it. Like you wait till the end to be like, okay, I couldn't counter anything. I didn't want to counter anything. So I'm just going to blow up this thing instead. Or bring this back. Yeah, it is only creature or planeswalker. I, I do feel if it's a, you know, some kind of non-land permanent or whatever, I'd be like much more interested because sometimes the creatures are just not the problem. <laughs> yeah, very often. <laughs> what if it's an ascendancy, you know? <laughs> what if they have Riveteer's ascendancy out? You can't blow it up with Obscure Charm. All right. Broker's Charm is the next one. It's a green, a white, and a blue for an instant. Your three choices are target creature you control gets plus one plus O until end of turn. It deals damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker and an opponent controls. Okay. Choice number two, destroy target enchantment. Choice number three, draw two cards. So it's a punch spell, a, a removal for just enchantments, or draw two cards. Yeah, this one is again, like I feel like 73rd card slot status. I think it's even lower. It's probably like, you know, n my 93rd card. Remember, when we say 73rd, we're talking uh, before lands. Yeah. Right? You're going to put in 65 cards. It's really interesting. Cards. If these didn't, if this was like two in a green, they, I think I'd be having a different conversation. What if it exiled enchantments? Because I feel like gods Ooh. are such a problem. Yeah. Yeah. That the destruction on enchantment, as soon as I see that, I'm like, nope, I want it to exile an enchantment because too often the, the destroying an enchantment will not do what I want. Yeah. And again, do you play this or do you play Beast Within that yeah. costs three mana and can just get any permanent? Grasp of Fate. Yeah. It's three permanents, one from each. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's not an instant, but yeah, I don't like Broker's Charm. I don't think we'll probably, you know, I'm not going to play it. I do think though that if you're like, again, you're you're getting into magic, you're playing commander with early decks. These actually are pretty good in the five to six power level area, probably. Like, Yeah, they're probably like utter end powerful, which is a card we used to play a lot a few years ago and it's still like... I still play it a You're not going to be embarrassed if it's in your deck, so it will still do stuff. This yeah. is probably better than, you know, vastly overcosted thing or things that aren't modal. Yep. 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 Alright, let's look at the Maestro's Charm. Blue, a black, and a red for an instant. Choose one. One. Look at the top five cards of your library. Put one of those cards into your hand and the rest into your graveyard. Number two, each opponent loses three life and you gain three life. Now, number three, Maestro's Charm deals five damage to target creature or planeswalker. Now, okay, so so the last two on these not super relevant. The yeah. first one not super relevant. No, no mode is good. Like I, I'm not happy about any mode. May, maybe I have to do the draw my best out of my top five, put some in my graveyard. Yeah, but that's not great. And the drain, the the second one is just bad. Like you, wh you're what, never gonna do that. What games do you <laughs> want to do that? Yeah, and even the five damage to creature planeswalker, you could. There is better spells, unholy heat, you know, at one red or whatever. There's it's like too if, you, if you want to do burn, right? So I think this is tough because it's like, oh, maybe you want stuff in your graveyard. But when you cast Maestro's Charm, look at your mana base right afterwards and go, uh oh, I can't do three things I had in my hand waiting for this because the mana value yeah. takes three colors to do so. Um, so it's all of these are really color intensive, and that that has to be. You know, the card quality has to be better than that for us to really think that this is good to go. All right, the last charm is Riveteer's Charm. This is the Jund one, black, red, and green. For an instant, three choices. Choice one, target opponent sacrifices a creature or planeswalker. Target opponent, not all your opponents. Um, sorry, they sacrifice a creature or planeswalker they control with the highest mana value among creatures or planeswalker and planeswalkers they control. Ah. Choice two is exile the top three cards of your library until your next end step. You may play those cards. And then choice number three is exile target player's graveyard. Okay. This is, I think, a little bit better than everything except for maybe obscure charm. I think it's close to on this level. Um, the sacrifice thing is the worst one because 
It what only you target opponent. To get their six trap. You want their yeah. drop. It doesn't. You don't get to target it. And the fact that it's creature or planeswalker they control with oh, the yeah. highest mana value. <laughs> they so can choose. Sometimes they might be able to choose. Yeah. yeah, they have like a Jang Yangu that's super low. They're like, I'm gonna do this one. But the exile target player's graveyard, when that's relevant, it's backbreakingly relevant. Will probably yeah. just like basically KO that player. And then the fact that you can exile the top three cards of your library until your next end step, you may play those cards. Three man exile three, yeah. Yeah. Better than the do, march of the death, the red march. I and think. it's instant, so you can do it on your end step and have all your mana available before your next end step. Yeah. And you get to play all three, I think, which is nice. Yeah. And uh, of course, if you flip over two lands, so you don't get three cards every time. Yeah. Um, but it's still like that's quite powerful for three mana look at three new cards yeah it's again another weird position where if you pass the turn and you're like i'm gonna be able to cast rivet tears charm by the end of the thing it's like okay you're either doing the exile or you're waiting to exile someone's graveyard so if you don't have a lot of exile graveyard stuff and you you like the the maybe you're playing a deck with prosper in it and you want to be casting things from exile i don't know it's it's, it's a stretch it's not it, this to me is again right on the edge yeah the play i think it's like a little bit like rakdos charm where you'll hold it up and it has a safety backup of okay fine nothing scary happens i'll do the middle choice i will imp impulsively draw three cards yeah and it's way better than rakdos charm because so many times i look at rakdos charm in, in my hands like this is doing nothing, nothing. Yeah, it's because there's just times when nobody has any creatures, not going to do any damage. Nobody's graveyard matters. Also, mattered. yeah, graveyards. Yeah, some you just don't have a graveyard heavy deck or yeah. heavy uh, meta at that point. But when it matters, it will. Rakdos Charm is crazy because when it matters, it kills people or just turns their whole deck off. Yeah, or you misplay with it. Yeah, right? and this has some of that. I think it's okay. Not all right. right, and notably, these are all uncommon, so we didn't expect their power level to be super high anyway. Yeah, I would say in general, I only want to run modal spells like this if there's one mode that I really, really like. And I would say there's one mode you really like, and one mode that you're okay with happening. In yeah. this case, it's kind of like Riveteer's Charm. You either get the top three cards, or you exile someone's graveyard. Yeah, the top three cards pretty good. Okay, uh, there is also. Uh, another cycle, a lot of cycles in this set. Mm -hmm. It's it's we're gonna call it the hideaway ding, cycle. Ding. I'm thinking of a bicycle going around the blocks <laughs> in New Capenal. Get your cycles. Get your cycles here. See? Yeah. So we won't read all of them, but we will read the one thing that is common on all of them. So I'll take the white one as an example. It's rabble rousing. It's enchantment with hideaway five. Hideaway is back. When this enchantment enters the battlefield, look at the top five cards of your library, exile one face down, then put the rest on the bottom in a random order. Before we had lands that did this, like Spine Rock Knoll, but now we have an enchantment. This is a five man enchantment, notably. Yeah, and so the the thing is you exile that one card out of your top five, and then each enchantment, there's one for each color, yep. each mono color, has a different sort of... Um, a, a different activation what, what would you call it uh things needed requirement. to activate requirement yeah, yeah, yeah a yeah. different requirement once you hit that requirement that spell you exiled away you can cast it for free yep so this one's all about if you have 10 or more creatures after you know attacking then you can cast that spell for free and yeah. the rest of them you have to have 10 creatures and attack what yeah well what's whenever you attack you create that many with one or more creatures you create that many one one green and white citizen creature tokens so you could attack you know oh, okay. five creatures make five and then you get there but this is a five mana do nothing enchantment when it hits the battlefield i i don't know and you also don't know what the five cards are so that's a big part of it yeah all these also they have sort of two modes one is you meet the hideaway requirement and then you cast that hideaway spell for free yeah um, they're all like they take place after a specific thing that happens though notably so it's like whenever you draw your first card or whenever you uh cast a multicolored spell or at the beginning of combat or at the beginning of your upkeep oh this is interesting i assumed you sacked to the enchantment to do these but that's not true that's how the hideaway lands work right no yeah, that's yeah. not true either no no this enchantment sticks around forever yeah, oh, okay. This makes them a little better than I thought because you, th all these enchantments have another effect. Yeah. They do the hideaway thing and then they have like a triggered ability or something. Yeah, passive effect basically. Oh, they're a little better than I thought. I didn't realize that until just now. Yeah, I mean, so the black one, Cemetery Tampering, two in the black, hideaway five. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may mill three cards. Then if there are 20 or more cards in your graveyard, you can play the exiled card. So if you like a three-man enchantment that will mill you three in your upkeep, then you may consider playing this card because it will never go away unless someone removes it, even when you cast a hideaway spell so that effect even after you cast the high was supposed to happen is every upkeep mill three yeah so it'll never be worse than upkeep mill three and then sometime you may just cast a sweet spell off of it for free on turn you know whatever yeah. you're milling with other stuff yeah, yeah. Uh, it got a little better i like the, the red one the most actually yeah i think the red one is easily the strongest because i already play storm kiln artist yep so it's a hideaway five two and a red widespread thieving whenever you cast a multicolor spell create a treasure token this the card could end there and be fine yep but then it says then you may play pay wooberg and then if you do you play your exiled hideaway card without paying its mana cost so that's not so great that's like joda it's actually not a, a red card anymore because of that too it's that's a right yeah color. It's 
it's a five it's color. Five go- you can maybe play this in Joda because you're casting. You're already trying to get... You're trying, yeah. 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 So I, most of the spells you're casting should be, you know, I think should be multi. Well, actually, I don't know. Yeah. Probably a lot aren't in a Joda deck, right? They're yeah, going to be on missions and Eldrazi you know, and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. I think you'd have to look at your deck and say, if I had 30 plus multicolored cards, I yeah. could play this as a Stormkill artist, basically, that costs uh, three. Yeah. But every time you cast a multicolored spell, you get a treasure. It's very powerful. Like I said, Stormkill mm-hmm. Arnest is kind of busted. That's for instance and sorceries, obviously, but yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Th- okay. You can, uh, we're not going to read all these, but they're all, I think, fine now that that I noticed you don't have to sacrifice yeah. them. Yeah. You basically, it's the, the, the barometer is does your deck really like the first ability sans actually casting the, the hideaway spell? If yeah. it does, then yeah, take a deeper look into it. And yeah. the, obviously the lower CMC ones are better. I think the ones that are five. Five, yeah, it's are, rough. Uh, it's pretty tough, yeah. Pretty tough. Okay. okay. Um, next up, we're going to talk about the new Planeswalkers <gasps> in Streets of New Capenna. There are three of them, but before we do, we got to take a quick break and hear a message from our sponsors. The Command Zone is filmed in front of a live studio audience. So I said to the guy, that's not the Sylvan Library, that's my lunch! <laughs> Jimmy, he's such a rascal. Hey, what's going on here? Ooh. Well, we wanted to watch Friends, but it's not on American Netflix. So we decided to make our own sitcom instead. Aww. Well, I, I mean, I do appreciate all the effort, but why not just use ExpressVPN? You can fire up the app, change your location to the UK, and then go on Netflix and watch all the friends you want. ExpressVPN controls where sites think you're located, and with nearly a hundred different countries to choose from, that's a lot of Netflix libraries. <laughs> all right, Jake, that's enough with the soundboard. <laughs> And it's not just Netflix. It works with any streaming service, in HD and with lightning fast speeds. No buffering, no lag. Best of all, you can use it on your phone, computer, and even your smart TV. Looks like ExpressVPN is the VPN of our problems. (laughs) Jake. Sorry, Josh, I serve a higher calling now. So if you want to get access to hundreds of new shows, use our link right now, expressvpn.com slash command, and you can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash command. Again, go to expressvpn.com slash command to learn more. You have one new voice message from mom. Hi, honey. It's Mother of Runes. I know you hate it when I leave voice messages instead of just doing a text, but give me a break. I was printed in Urza's block. I just wanted to tell you how much I loved these Raycon wireless earbuds you got me for Mother's Day. They're the perfect gift for any multitasking mom like me. They're my first pair of wireless earbuds, but with Raycon's easy setup and seamless Bluetooth pairing, even I had no problem figuring them out. Now I'm listening to so many hot bops, they should start calling me Mother of Tunes. <laughs> and I just love the bright colors you picked out too. They look hip and fit right into my ears with comfortable gel tips. With 8 hours of playtime and 32 hours of battery life, I never have to go without my Raycons. Heck, I'm using them to call you right now. You've made this the best Mother's Day ever. Ever. And for only half the price of other premium brands. Thrifty decisions like that are why you're my favorite child. Tell mom how much you love her and make sure she hears it in crystal clear audio quality with Raycon. Go to buyraycon.com slash command to get 15% off your Mother's Day order. That's buyraycon.com slash command. You know, I was playing against the gods deck the other day and I just found it so interesting how they transformed all these deities from the different pantheons into their magic versions. Oh, for sure. Mythology stuff is super interesting. I think everybody knows I love history podcast and i've been listening to a really good one recently it's called echoes of history ragnarok oh like norse mythology like kaldheim exactly it's inspired by the video game assassin's creed valhalla dawn of ragnarok and delves into the real norse mythology the game is based on whether you're an assassin's creed fan a history buff or even just a curious person echoes of history ragnarok offers a deep dive into these epic legends from the creation of the universe to the end of the world you'll learn about the gods beasts and other creatures that live in the nine realms and explore the complicated sagas of loki odin and thor echoes of of History Ragnarok is hosted by the history guy, Lance Geiger. He boils down all the mythology and its real world context into an engaging narrative so you don't have to be an expert to follow along. Nice. Well, I'll give it a listen. Oh, you totally should. You would really enjoy it. Cool. So how'd it go against the gods deck? Oh, bad. Gods are strong. 
Find the Echoes of History podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge five all new episodes available right now, as well as the first season about Vikings. Search for Echoes of History wherever you listen to your podcast to subscribe and listen. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Hey, it's me, Tamio. I've been going through some unexpected changes lately. I moved back home, had to make new friends. Jinka Taxi has turned me into a Phyrexian. This isn't quite how I saw my life going, and honestly, it's been pretty stressful. But thanks to BetterHelp, I've been working through that stress with my therapist, all from the comfort of my own home, which I guess is new Phyrexia now? Ugh. We all have those moments when our life changes directions or just feels incomplete, but you don't have to get completed to start feeling whole again. Therapy is a great tool to talk things through with someone who will never judge, take sides, or corrupt your home world. And BetterHelp makes it easy. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy. Give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Command Zone listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash command zone. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash command zone. All righty, we are back talking about in the 99 streets of New Capenna cards. Uh, very exciting. Lots of stuff. And now we're going to talk about the Planeswalkers. Everyone is very excited. Elspeth and Obnixilis and Vivian are the big singers or Planeswalkers on this plane. And uh, let's find out. Typically, the answer is no. If any of these Planeswalkers are commander playable. I think at least one is. Oh, great. Let's see. Let's, let's see if you can get it. Is it Elspeth? Her. Let's find out. Uh, she's the first one, Elspeth Resplendent. Three white white for a five loyalty Elspeth. Her plus one, choose up to one target creature, put a one one counter and a counter from among either flying, first strike, lifelink, or vigilance on it. Okay. Her negative three, look at the top seven cards of your library. You may put a permanent card with mana, mana value three or less from among them onto the battlefield with a shield counter on it. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Okay. And our negative seven is create a, uh, sorry, create five, three, three white angel angel creature tokens with flying. Okay, so you do get to put a permanent, including lands, with her minus three. Yep. Uh, so that's kind of cool. And then this is the first time Elspeth has specifically been like, I can actually put more than just a one-one counter on you. You do want flying, first strike, lifelink, or vigilance. And you can actually stack this on creatures as well. Uh, and you can also just plus one and it's up to one. So you can just plus one or with no, no uh, targets on the battlefield. Still, if I play a five mana spell and it gives a plus one plus one counter and like a lifelink counter or something, that's not that's not good, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, for me, this like reads like, hey, play it in a Heliod deck. Maybe you can find Heliod with the minus three. Uh, sure. You know, if you're playing mono white, but it, to me, this isn't that great. Doesn't protect itself, which is really important with Planeswalkers. Yeah, I don't want to play this for the negative three because then I'm paying five mana to look at the top seven cards <laughs> and put a three CMC thing out. Why don't I just put another good three CMC thing and then I'll only play three mana for that rather than five? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, Josh. I wish I had a good answer for you other than that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I don't think this is particularly good. It definitely doesn't stand up to the other Elspeths that we know and love. So Yeah, especially not our classic make t three one ones Elspeth. Yeah, or champion. board wipe Elspeth. <laughs> yeah, let's just say that this Elspeth seems great for other formats. Uh, probably not so hot in EDH. All right, this is the one I think is playable, though. It is ramp, though, if you think about it. Five mana, get one land into play is not... Hey, man, yeah, white's, white's struggling. These, it, no, actually, white's, white's doing, doing good, good, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next up we got Obnixilis, or Mobnixilis, as we have been calling him, the adversary. He's won a black and a red for a three-mana Planeswalker. They did it again, another three-mana Planeswalker. That alone is the reason it's probably playable. Yeah, so it comes in with three loyalty and has an additional line of text at the top that says Casualty X. So this copy, the copy isn't legendary and has starting loyalty X. So Casualty is, it says, as you cast this spell, you may sacrifice a creature with power X. When you do copy this spell, the copy becomes a token. So if you have a five power creature out, you can Casualty X, play up next list, copy it, and then that copy comes in with five loyalty. Now, he does have three abilities, a plus one. Each opponent loses two life unless they discard a card. If you control a demon or a devil, you gain two life. Not so great. Minus two, create a 1-1 one, one red devil creature token with when this creature dies, it deals one damage to any target. And then I think the minus seven is what you're looking for here. Minus seven, target player draws seven cards and loses seven life. So that's the Grizzle brand. Sort of, yeah, sort of. I mean, that's a <laughs> You have to sacrifice. So the only way you're going to ultimate this is if you casualty X a creature with seven power or more, and then you can instantly minus seven the copy. 
And you have to have some cards in your deck, probably the same sort of deal where you want cards that have high power, but you don't pay the, you know, that mana yeah. value that you would normally associate with high power. Yep, yep. So, so Rotting Registor. That's perfect. That's a 7-6. For three mana. Yeah. Uh, Molten Steel Dragon is another one. Oh, I like this a lot, actually. Yeah, because it's four and two Phyrexian Red, so you could pay four and four life. Yeah. And then it has Fire Breathing for Phyrexian Red, so... For two, four, six, eight, ten life and four mana plus the three for Omnix <laughs> list, seven, you could ultimate him, which would also draw you seven and you'd lose seven more life. So you're going to lose 17 life okay. to draw seven. All right. Well, what if you want a plus one ob- your Omnix list copy as well? So you're making the opponent discard two cards instead and maybe you gain some life? Yeah. It's two life... Uh, Unless they discard a card. So they're going to take the two. Yeah. So it's like play two Omnixilluses, plus plus, everybody loses four. That's uh, four, eight, 12 damage to the table. And you'll have two Planeswalkers sitting there. I mean, the, the thing okay. about having two Planeswalkers sitting there, and I don't think people should concentrate too much on getting it to seven when you play it. Correct. Yeah. You're not getting, you're not building your deck around Omnixilus. Yeah. But two. Planeswalkers at like four loyalty, one's likely to survive, right? Like, yeah. It's, and you could also minus them and make the two devil tokens. And then it's going to be very hard to get through two devil tokens. You know, might have some flying or whatever to kill both of them. To though. kill both of them, yeah. 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 So I think you're probably going to be able to defend Obnix List. Don't think about just trying to ultimate him straight off the bat. How do you make some blockers or how do you do? I think the drain ability here is really not that impactful, unless maybe it's like you're just doing this to add on a little extra damage, four damage to everyone. Not that bad. It's going to be annoying, I think. Even with like sacrificing a one power like token or something, right? Yeah. Omnixilis, make a second one with one loyalty, you know, minus one plus the other. And now I've got one sing there at one loyalty and one sing there at two. And it's mm-hmm. like. Boy, it's going to take a lot of attacks to get in there because they got the devil already. Maybe they already have a creature. Yeah. Yeah. People might just be like, eh, whatever. It's not that big a deal and let you like mess around. And there's a lot of value if you if you just do that for two or three turns. Yeah. You don't let the mob get out of control. It's not a good idea. <laughs> so. Okay. So I, I think you could probably see this again. You want to ask yourself, do, do, do I have a deck that this fits into? And if that's the case, then see if it works. Yeah. The casualty part, you're, you're going to want to sacrifice something when you cast it. Otherwise, it's a bit underwhelming. Yeah. But again, Rakdos is, usually has expendable creatures lying around and wants to sacrifice things anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. The third uh, Planeswalker does have some combos associated with it. It is Vivian on the Hunt. Four green, green, six mana for a four loyalty Planeswalker. Plus two, you may sacrifice a creature. If you do, search your library for a creature card with mana value equal to one plus the sacrifice creature's mana value. Put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle. Plus one, mill five cards, then put any number of creature cards milled this way into your hand. Okay. Negative one. So she has no ultimate. Create a 4-4 green rhino warrior creature token. She has a plus two, a plus one, and a minus one. Yeah, and the minus one, you make a 4-4 as a six. So I think worst case scenario, you're making the 4-4 for blockers. But this is just a combo-tastic card because you only need a three drop in play to create the chain to make this go off. Yeah, we've, it's birthing pod, sort of, right? Yeah, so you got Vivian, you sack a free drop, you're going to grab Felidar Guardian to blink Vivian that's going to then sack the Guardian to get a Karmic Guide. The Karmic Guide is going to reanimate your Felidar Guardian, and then you're going to blink Vivian again, and then you're going to sack the Felidar Guardian, and then you're going to get Kikijiki, and now you got a Kikijiki and the Karmic Guide, and you can just animate and you reanimate the Felidar Guardian, right? So you just need a three drop in play to go. <laughs> everybody, but got, everybody got that, right? You also cannot have any of those cards in your hand. <laughs> that's a really good point i mean it's only three cards so it's not super tough to not have one in your hand yeah and like you said play vivian if you have a three drop win is pretty powerful yeah pretty Again, powerful. if you blink the vivian it comes back it resets it right it yeah. allows you to activate it again so the felidar yeah. guardian you know the real mistake that is there. a three color combo as well and you have to be in jun so oh no jun you have to be in naya yeah so I, I could see that being the case. If you're playing the Birthing Pod deck, maybe Vivian is just another thing on top of your Eldritch Evolution and all those other cards. Um, In some ways, it's less mana intensive than doing the same thing with Pod, which you have to pay at least one mana each time to tap it. Yeah, 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 yeah true. So, yeah, I mean, that that is a combo. That is a thing you can do. I, <laughs> <laughs> that is a thing I mean, you can when do. you compare it to Birthing Pod, because obviously that plus two is the most interesting you know yeah the other part the mill five cards and then put any number of creature cards mill this way into your hand like you're likely to get one or two maximum it's not a very good usage they'll make the rhinos is fine but there's better cards you know playing a six cmc card that's going to make two four four rhinos over the course of two Mm -hmm. turns before it dies if you're lucky is not what we want to be doing so you're really playing it for that plus two when you compare it to birthing pod i mean how do you think 
Well, Birthing Pot gets shut down in more competitive play groups by your Collector Oofs, Karn the Great Creator. People play those cards a lot. But generally, if you're in the Birthing Pot deck, I don't think you... It Maybe it's just a redundant part of it, is having a six drop out that can do it. But I don't know. It, it doesn't scream like, you got to play this. Yeah, I think if you're going for that plus two ability and you're not comboing, then just play Eldritch Evolution or something, right? Yeah. Um, you know, Nature's uh, Lore or something. Not Nature's Lore. Nature's... Uh, natural Order? Natural, natural order. order. I got yeah. there. Natural Order. Yeah, yeah. it's a great card. Um, so, yeah, I think Vivian... It, when you see her, you should be scared because they're probably comboing because I don't... It's not a very good card if you're not. Yeah, unless you love Vivian and love that flavor. I mean, she, Vivian is pretty cool. All right. She looks okay. cool. Now we're going to talk about the individual cards by color, finally. But before we do, we want to let you know that we actually do talk about a few of these cards that we're going to talk about, right? We don't talk about the same ones. What we did... Oh, we talk about other, right, you're right. Yeah, so we did uh, our Command Zone Live episode two with our good buddy Post Malone, um, and we've released the the VOD of that on our YouTube channel, and that's where we talk about our favorite cards from the Commander product. Right. So we're not going to talk about any Commander product cards here. We're just going to talk about stuff from the main set and the set booster only stuff. So if you're interested in our thoughts on the Commander product cards in the 99, go to Command Zone Live episode number two. Easy to find on our YouTube channel. Yeah, it's a lot of fun too. It's a, it's just a fun experience. Yeah, Posty's, Posty's, I mean, he knows a lot about magic. So yeah. if you haven't seen him in his element, you, you might be surprised. But the guy definitely, he's oh, definitely for real. He ain't faking it. Yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's talk about white cards up first. Uh, the first one has created a lot of buzz around the internet. Um, it's Halo Fountain, two and a white for an artifact, and it's got three activated abilities on it. So the first one costs one white, the second one, one costs white, white, and then the last one costs white, 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 so five white. Okay, so let's go through them. The first one, white, tap, Halo Fountain, untap a tap creature you control, create a 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature token. The second ability is white, white, tap, untap two tapped creatures you control to draw a card. Okay, and the last one is five white pips, tap, untap, 15 tapped creatures you control, you win the game. <laughs> so you are almost never activating this for five white. If one, unless you're in a two color deck, it's going to be extremely hard to make five white mana for one. That's a good point. <laughs> it's also going to be extremely hard to get 15 creatures tapped. Now you can attack Generally, with them. Generally, if you were able to have 15 creatures, you've won with Crater Hoof or some of them, right? Like, yeah. how often does somebody have 15 creatures on the board and they're not winning because of those 15 creatures? Yeah, or they've just sat around and made a bunch of oozes. I don't know. The thing about this is that you can like swing with all of them and then use this at instant speed to untap them and win the game. Uh, but I'm more interested in the second part, which is you can pay two untap to tap it to untap two tapped creatures and then you draw a card. So that is white card draw at a pretty steep price and there's a lot of hoops to jump through to get there. Two tap creatures... How are you tapping them? Who knows? If they're going into combat, are they going to survive? Do you want to pay white, white tapping this to draw a card and that, that's going to choke your mana up too? So uh, this is an interesting card. Yeah, I think it's been sort of massively overrated by most people that saw it and were like, this is crazy. Yeah, it says win the game on it. Whoa. It's definitely not crazy. And they're, they are doing a thing that we've asked them to do, which is make it very white intensive. So this yeah. is not a card that's going in a bunch of decks that, that aren't heavy white. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does have some usage. I mean, I think... Just creating a 1-1 one, one every turn for one mana is not the worst. Not the worst. Sometimes drawing off of it can be good. And the untapped two tapped creatures is a requirement, right? You can't have two untapped creatures and do that. Yeah. You have to be able to get two creatures tapped. But when you do that, you are causing an advantage to happen because you're untapping two creatures that were tapped. And most of the time, that's good for you. Yeah, so if you are a deck that plays those untappers, then obviously this is great. Yeah. So this like the Josh Lequai special. And I think that's where some combos happen with Halo Fountain. So yeah. if you have something that can untap a permanent, like Cure's Follower, Fedo Alchem Alchemist, Kelpie Guide! Kelpie Guide! Kelpie Guide. And then you have another creature that can tap and create at least two white mana. Yeah, as, an, as a result of the untapping. So Argothian Elder and Crossum Restore both can untap two or three lands with Threshold. Yeah, also if you play like Lotus Field or Lotus Veil, you might create a single land that can tap for at least two white. Even those enchantment lands that you Yeah, always, Market yeah. Festival and stuff, put yeah. that on the land, on a bounce land or something, you might be able to do it. So what you're trying to do is create it. So when I tap two creatures... One of them can untap the Halo Fountain, and the other one can create the two white mana. And then I tap the Halo Fountain, use the white mana to untap those two creatures, which then tap to redo it, and now you can draw your entire deck. Okay, so that's making me more excited, but it also means that you can't. Play, it's not a mono white play anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and did Crossum Restore need Halo Fountain to go infinite? No, nope. not really. It, it does that pretty well on its own. Yeah, it's, Staff of Domination is way easier to do this than right. than Halo Fountain, but it is another way to do it. Elgarth and Elder. Maze of Ith, 
um, combos already kind of work, yeah. but they are a little bit restricted to um, uh, only during combat, which I guess you could draw your deck during combat. If you are doing like Argothian Elder with two planes and a Federal Alchemist also, you won't net any mana from this. So yes, you'll draw your deck, but you won't have infinite mana. So right. what are you going to do? You might be able to Thassa's Oracle or something at the end of that. Yeah, who are you going to call? But this is like the worst Thassa's Oracle ever because, <laughs> you know, this, the, just the number of cards needed to make the combo work. So I think Halo Fountain, like, it's good. It's interesting, but it's very fair. It's very fair. Now, do you think this is good in like a Duretti deck? Wait, you can't play. No, this no, 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 sorry, I didn't mean Dreddy. I meant who's the bird wizard that taps stuff down that you can catch from the command zone? Derevi. Derevi. That's yeah. what I meant. Derevi. Imperial tactician. Yeah, right. So Halo Fountain is yeah. all about getting your untapped stuff in there, and you're drawing off it. So I could see something because you're already kind of playing the Kelpie Guide Cross Restore potentially in those decks. Sure, where you care about tapping, untapping. Now all of a yeah. sudden, this is a component on both sides of your strategy. You now, tap do it, people you like you for doing this? No, because you're yeah. playing Winter Orb and crap, and 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 nobody likes that. Yeah. Yeah. I do think it could be interesting, too, if you've got, like, Avenger of Zendikar, March of the Multitudes in Wait, your Wait, just deck. to make, yeah, and then you're doubling tokens with Anointed Procession. And if you have Cryptolith Ride or something like that, you could tap mm -hmm. them all of a sudden. And so you could win with never attacking, right? You tap them for the mana, the white mana that activates the Halo Fountain, because on your end step, you March of the Multitudes or okay. whatever, yeah. And another, I think, pretty cool thing, and this is actually... Maybe somebody will see this happen to them once or twice. If you're already playing the cards that turn all your lands into creatures or everybody's uh -huh. lands into creatures, now we're talking. So Natural Affinity, Root Awakening, Sylvan Awakening. There's a number of cards that do this. There's, there's more that we... Joe Rail, the OG Joe Rail. There's, there's a bunch, yeah. right? So you could suddenly be like, okay, turn all lands or all my lands into, into creatures. Two, two creatures. I have... 10 lands out, that's 10 creatures already. Yep, and I can tap those, because they're mana. still lands, I tap them for mana, Yeah. and now if I already had four or five creatures, I may be at that 15, and I just bada bing bada boom. Yeah, I hope you also made were able to make five white mana with the lands you untapped. Hopefully, but you know, if you get 10 <laughs> lands, five white might be doable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I actually like that quite a bit. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, otherwise, I think if you're just in sort of like the white weenie deck on white, you play Raise the Alarm, you want to swing with two creatures and untap and draw a card. Halo Fountain is sitting on the edge now, which is kind of crazy because I think maybe a, two years ago we would have looked at this card and been like, nice, amazing, Look, think of the possibilities. But we've got even great options in this set. White's really getting a lot of help in terms of drawing cards, welcoming Vampire. So we're getting there. I mean, imagine it just said white, white, tap Halo Fountain, draw a card. Is that broken? Doesn't no. feel like it. Black has greed, which is like, you could just do that as many times as yeah. you want, right? Yeah, this yeah, yeah. requires the thing to tap. So it already has hoops. So yeah, I think it's, Everyone should calm down. Halo Fountain is fine. It's, it's not broken. It's not as good as this uncommon, I think, which is called Rumor Gatherer. It's one white white for a 2-1 elf wizard alliance. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, scry one. If this is the second time this ability is resolved this turn, draw a card instead. So now the, now we're talking for white weenie token decks. You play this, you play raise the alarm. Two creatures enter the battlefield, you scry one for one, and then you draw a card for the second one. Yeah, scry one, draw one. Anytime you have two creatures enter, even if you only have one creature enter, you still get the scry. Yeah. It's kind of... um the opposite of welcome not the opposite but it's like the inverse of welcoming vampire right welcoming vampire says oh, we right. want your creatures to be small and we'll let you draw this one says we want you to have multiple creatures and then you draw yeah uh, this is really good in like the adeline deck which wants to have you attacking all out and makes tokens with you yep uh that's it's pretty cool i like this a lot more than the other card because this is with the strategy you can see it happening you under even if you just play this in one creature you still get a scry one so it's not like you're completely out of a card value you just need to play one creature to get that train going yeah, and most token decks don't have much problem making two creatures on a turn. Yeah. And if you can do it at instant speed, all of a sudden you can maybe create two on your turn, two on the next turn, two on the okay. next turn. That Elspeth that you were talking about earlier would do it, and then maybe a raise the alarm, call the copper coats type, type thing on another player's turn. And now I'm scry one, draw one twice. Yeah. That's just something that, you know, token decks haven't had the ability to do very often. So I, yeah. I do think this has a home, but it's not the same as Welcoming Vampire, I th which I think is a little bit better. It's easier to cast like one two drop or two CM or two power creature yeah. than it is to, ca to get multiple creatures into play every single turn. I will though say though that Mentor of the Meek is finally, I think, fully outclassed by these kinds of cards. I don't know if I play Mentor anymore. In yeah, white it's deck. interesting. I did just cut it from my Shurikai deck. Yeah, it's just go. a. It's like why I don't. I'm not low on draw, but of course Shorkai draws me cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think in mono white maybe Mentor of the Meek still sticks around, but if you pair it with any other color, it's probably not good enough anymore. Yep. All right, so those are the white cards from New Capenna. Let's move on. Write down the Wooburg order onto blue. All right, the first card is even the score, blue, 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 and X for an instant. 
This spell costs blue, blue, blue less to cast if an opponent has drawn four or more cards this turn. Okay, now so that now we're talking. Now it's just X? Yeah, if you're playing against me, it's just X. <laughs> <laughs> Every turn of the game. It says draw X cards. Yeah, four or more cards. Yeah, X mana draw X cards. Count me in. One mana for one card is an extremely good value. Yeah, I mean, if you can count on that happening, where it's just X draw X at instant speed, yeah, it's like the best X draw spell ever. Ever, yeah, yeah pretty darn good. Um, I, I, in most, I'd say these days in the higher power games I'm playing, I see someone draw four cards in the turn, almost always. They also have to do that at a time when you have mana available for X, right? People do draw a lot of cards, but how often in those situations are you sitting there with all your mana untapped? That's yeah. the other part of the question. Yeah. Like, how often can you predict they're going to do it? Yeah. It, it, again, you need to be maybe in the deck that just wants to be reactive. You're holding this or Mystic Confluence up. Yeah, that's true. If you have a deck that's already holding its mana up and waiting to see what happens. Yeah, but you hold Mystic Confluence for five mana and then someone draws four cards and you're like, you know what, I'll play even the score and draw five cards for five mana instead. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, exactly. And I'll save my Mystic Confluence for later. Yeah. Yeah, so you want to have options because this sometimes you'll be holding your Mystic Confluence and they'll cast a board wipe that you don't want to happen. And you go, okay, counter that. Right. Drawing the cards wouldn't have been good for me here because it wouldn't. I wouldn't have got the discount. Yeah, if you draw into this thanks to someone wheeling, then you're definitely casting it. Yeah, you can be the cause of your opponents drawing the four cards, too. So you, oh, could, right. you could wheel. It doesn't say they drew it on their own accord, right? Yeah, it's yeah. It's like, no, I wheeled. Or you're in a Nekusar deck or something that's already helping people yeah, draw cards. Yeah, this yeah. This gets way better because now you can predict it because you're going to cause it. But you have to draw this with the wheel because you can't play this for that X spell and then wheel on top because you, you can't get the X mana. So there's a little bit of finagling you have to do. But I think, again, we've seen cards that are just blue, blue X draw X cards, and those are, I think, playable in the right decks in, in EDH, so I think even this card has a very high chance of making its way around to more playgroups. It is. It's nice. Yeah, it's nice. It's, it is interesting. They've been kind of messing with this three mana X, three mana plus X spell, uh, yeah. blue draw at instant speed card. They had Commander's Insight, Diviner's Portent. Um, Stroke of Genius is probably the oldest one of them, yeah. And I still think Stroke of Genius is probably the best one just because two colorless mana is a lot easier than blue, 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 blue. blue. blue yeah. And Blue yeah. Sun Zenith is in this uh, category as well, which I think people underrate the fact that it shuffles itself back into your library so it becomes a win condition right. when you create infinite mana and draw your deck because you get to go boom, play it, shuffle it into my library, draw it, boom, play, play it. it. So kill you, kill you, kill you on the same turn. Yeah. It can be sort of an alt backup win condition and, and you know, lab man type decks. But I, I do think that even the score is interesting. And, you know, if you're looking for a second stroke of genius and you're not looking to use Blue Sun Zenith to like win the game, then maybe even the score is probably the second best one now. Yeah. Maybe. Commander's Insight's pretty good if you're casting, like, two commanders, because mm -hmm. it's it's target uh, yeah, players draws X card plus an additional time for each time they've cast a commander, so it's, like, blue, blue, X, draw, three, whatever, four. So you're getting close to the one for one, but the fact that this can be one mana for one card and colorless at that yep. makes it very good. So you could even play this in a deck that doesn't have a ton of blue pips if you know that your opponents at some point are going to have this type of turn. And, you know, worst case scenario, you got seven mana open, nobody draws four cards, and you go, whatever, I'm going to tap seven, draw four. Yeah, it's yeah, not, exactly. That's, it's not that's the worst. Worst, right? Yeah, that's like, like yeah. There's 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 six mana draw fours in in yeah. Magic, so that's it's close enough. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the next one. I'm actually this is my type of card for sure. But the Ledger Shredder. I'm, ex I'm excited about it. Yeah. One in the blue for a Bird Advisor, looking pretty cool here. One, in, it's a one three with flying. Whenever a player casts their second spell each turn, Ledger Shredder connives. So this includes yourself. Yep. So conniving is you draw a card and then you discard a card. If you discard a non land card, they get to put a plus one plus one on, counter on the creature that connived. So this is every player, every turn when they cast their second spell. Theoretically, there are four players, so on each player's turn, you could loot, because conniving is just looting, Yep. Um, up to 16 times a rotation at the table. Yeah. <laughs> if everybody casts two spells on everybody else's 16 turn. 16 times. Oh, and everyone else's turn. Yeah, yeah. Past turn. I'm going to cast two spells on your turn. I want Josh's Ledger Shredder to keep shredding. Yeah, and then uh, past turn. Okay, I'm going to cast two spells on the next player's turn. Yeah, too. this if is everybody like does that. building a freaking, what's it called? One of those machines that, that does all this stuff. I don't know. That's never going to happen. No. One. The most, I think, is going to be two times per turn rotation, including not including yourself. I think it easily could be four. I think often it players cast two spells on their own turn. Yeah. So that's, that's a pretty common thing. But yeah, let's say it's two maybe a slightly over two like 2.2 mm -hmm. uh lo free loots per rotation of the table i think people just massively underrate how good looting is is this better than teferi 
the one that you can use at instant speed? I think it probably is, although Teferi has a removal aspect, which is hard to sure, square. The out. But the fact that Ledger Scrater just can't be attacked and killed that way, yeah. it's likely to loot you more in a game than Teferi will, because Teferi will die after yeah. one or two rotations. Do you ever want to kill someone else's Ledger Shredder? I, no. No, you don't want to <laughs> removal this thing, right? You want it to die from something else, incidentally. It has it's to jump block. It's a drop that does, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and it will get big. Yeah. Like, this is not crazy to play this on turn two, and by turn four or five, it's like five a or six, six power nine, flyer. Eight, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's real damage that's going to be coming in and make a difference in the game. Um, and and I just think there there's so many cards that go along with what this is doing, with the looting part of it, that are just naturally in your deck. How many times, Jimmy, have we talked about containment construct? Oh, man. My it's my call out. I wish I could say that this is my favorite card from this set. It's not though. Yeah. From Neon Dynasty. Yeah, yeah it's great. It's, Uncommon. It's rewarding you for discarding and it's a May ability too, which I really like about this. So you can discard, it's a land, you exile it, you can play that land from your graveyard. And if you don't want to exile it, just leave it in your graveyard. So containment construct with any kind of looting, you just get massive value. So it's another just little two drop. Nobody's really gonna want to kill it. It goes along with Ledger Shredder so well, and Containment Construct is going in a lot of decks. Mm -hmm. So you look at your deck and you go, well, I've already got that synergy. Boom. And you don't need a lot of synergy for Ledger Shredder because just the looting by itself will smooth your games out by a ton, right? You oh, keep, yeah, that's a good point. You keep a two or three land hand with or a, a five Shredder. land hand with a Ledger Shredder, and you're feeling like, I'm going to smooth out, and I'm going to get, like, if I need more lands, I'll find that, and if I need more spells, I'll find those. And my Ledger Shredder is going to get big. I'm going to have a viable creature in the late game. Yeah, I like that. I like it a lot. Um, currency converter is a card we talked about with Posty that yep. cares about discarding cards can allow you to you know get some value and bring those cards back to your hand. Ledger Shredder can work with that. Bag of Holdings another card. Yep. These are cards we're just seeing in in decks. Teferi's uh, Ageless Insight and Alhammer's Archive, which double your draw. I think that's where the big game is. Is if you're, if you're playing the eleven deck or whatever it is, and you already are going to be playing Ageless Insight, Alhammer's Archive, you want to draw cards, then then conniving is nuts. Draw two, discard one every single time. And then there's just incidental like. If you have Madness cards, or if you have Graveyard Recursion, you've got flashback cards in your deck. If you just have a smattering of those things, you might have seven, eight, nine, ten cards oh, in your deck. you definitely play this in the Kest deck, I feel like. It's oh, for sure, yeah. That, but I'm talking yeah. about decks that just happen to have little pockets of, like, I have a reanimate, I got an animate dead, I got three cards with flashback. Yeah. You know, I've got seven or eight cards in my deck that I will be happy to discard that aren't lands. Yeah. Because a lot of times you're just discarding the lands because you'll get glutted with them, and you just be like, oh, I only need one land in my hand, you know, I'll discard the rest, but then right. you get to the point where like, okay, well, I've got six good cards and one, I'll discard the Madness card and still cast it or I'll discard something I can get back later. Yeah, or you have some Graveyard Synergies built in that you can fetch it back with a fetch spell. I mean, the nice thing about Ledger Shredder is that you will just... You're looking at, let's say, in a three-turn game, instead of looking at 10 cards, you've now looked at 13... 15, 15, 17. Probably past turn three, like yeah. turn five or six. You, you're just now outpacing your opponents because every time that they draw their second spell, you're just getting a little extra value. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to have more better cards than you because I've looked at more cards. And it's a two drop. I just think this is like a really, really good card. I'm very excited to put in a bunch of decks. Yeah, I can't say too enough about getting card draw throughout the game because you need to rebalance your hand based on what's going on. There's so many yeah. times where I'm like, I got to keep this removal spell and then two turns later, I'm like, this removal spell is not relevant. They found a lightning greave. Yeah, yeah, so I'm going to, I now need to find something else. And yep. so Leisure Shredder, I think, because it keeps going. No one, I, no, I wouldn't remove this. I wouldn't, And the I wouldn't fact that like there's it. just less board wipes running around, right? More targeted removal. And the targeted removal is really being saved for the game ending threats. And this is not one of those things. It can be, though, over time. Yeah, that's, that's true. What, that's what, what you don't see. By the time they are, like, so scared of it because it's large that they have to kill it, think of how much value it's gotten you then. It's yep. got to be 7-8 power. You've looted so many times to get it there that you're like, yep, you killed it. Good job. It couldn't job. even attack you the yeah. whole time. Maybe you even swung with it a couple yeah. times. Yeah, yeah. Ledger Shredder is increasing in my book slowly. Thanks, Josh. All right. All right, I'll take this one home with me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, the good news, uh, it is a rare, so. <laughs> All right, next up, we have an interesting, uh, it's just a regular blue uh, common enchantment aura. For one blue enchant creature, enchant creature loses all abilities and is a green and white citizen creature with base power and toughness. One one named legitimate business person. That's hilarious. But also, this is a one mana blue enchantment removal spell. I just like that it turns them into legitimate business person. Yeah, great flavor. Protection. Yeah, I've been playing a lot of Cameron with Tran Transformation recently. That, of course, draws you a card. Yeah. Um, but Dark Steel Mutation, you still get played. You still see get played Witness Protection as well. Um, it can really disable someone if they can't sack their commander. And then they're like, oh, I'm swinging my one one at you. Will you block it? And you're like, no, it's a legitimate businessman. I'll let them in the door. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, I, although the difference with Dark Steel Mutation is it's indestructible, so they can't just hold it back to block with it. Uh, okay, yeah. Because if they do that with witness protection, it does have some value as a thing that people don't want to kill. 
Yeah. You don't want to swing into it. Yeah, because they'll just chump it and they'll get their thing back to the graveyard yeah. or it's just their commander, but... And it's not... Canvas Transformation draws you that card, which is huge, right? Like, yeah. your removal spell that's two mana drawing you a card. Yeah. That, that makes that kind of broken. So, yeah, I think this is fine, but I think I'm still playing the Pongifies and the... Pongifies pretty good. Of stuff. But uh, this will affect things that have, like, indestructible things Luster like that. Lusterstorm. So, yeah. All right. Uh, we're on to the black cards now. Angel of Suffering is first up. Three black, black for a 5-3 flying nightmare angel. We have black. We have angels in black now. Nice. Uh, if damage would be dealt to you, prevent that damage and mill twice that many cards. Okay. So no damage is ever happening to you again, but you're milling twice as much. And that will that will be a fast mill. Twice Someone as much. Someone hits you for five, you mill 10 cards. N- interesting to note, it's... It counts damage you do to yourself. Uh, All it's right. Not loss of life, just damage. But city of brass, mana barbs. Yeah. Penny of lands. the lands. Yeah. Oh, mana lands. barbs. With this is, I mean, if you're a, I want to mill myself out deck, yeah. which a lot are, right? Hermit druid decks and things like that. Yeah. Well, mana barbs is just crazy because every time you tap mana, you're gonna mill two. But you can't make this thing your commander. So how are you getting it out to have mana barbs combo with it? Okay, fine. So mana barbs unlikely to be comboed with it because they don't but it is a cool deck. combo <laughs> yeah you might play this in a deck that's like a stop hitting yourself deck or a hurt myself deck or uh, okay um, yeah or or some kind of like i'll be able to save myself or i want to mill myself out yeah uh, a deck it yeah it's really good with that card you've got on your phone right now sir conrad we always talk about this card you're going to be putting cards into the graveyard that's going to deal damage maybe it's you're doing sort of stuff in like your madrotha deck because you just want to get as much stuff in your deck as possible you know people are going to be targeting you because you're madrotha i mean it feels really bad to do any damage to the Sir Conrad, Muldrotha, a DC player, if they have this out. Yeah, th- this seems like more of a lightning rod for removal, which again is another reason that you might play a creature because you want players to use it on this. It doesn't make your deck win or lose, but it is very powerful in making your deck better if that's what you're trying to do. I've actually built a number of decks that are trying to kill people with some sort of earthquake style spell. Oh, earthquake is great because now you don't do the damage to yourself. Right. So there's a few X spells in red that de- that are like red X deal X damage to each you know player and yeah. each creature without flying or whatever. There's rolling earthquake. There's a few others. Um, and normally I try and like fork these or fury storm these yeah. and just do like 50 damage to everybody. <laughs> nice. But the problem is you'll do 50, 50 damage to yourself. Yeah. But you if you have yourself. angel of suffering out, you go, boom, sure. I mill myself out, but and it someone matter. goes, I'll remove their response. Sure. But I mean, you're not going <laughs> to do that into open mana. If you can help it, if you can help you're it, you're going to have your pyro blasts and your red elemental blast up and yeah. you're going to be like, okay. And, and you, you can often find those windows, um, so this creates, like, you can also play the cards that say you can't win the game or you can't lose the game. Um, yeah. Black's got a few of those. Yeah. To, so that might be in combination with those types of spells. Maybe you're in white, too, to get, you know, yeah. uh, even more access to that. I don't know. It's an interesting card, and I think... It's very interesting. There's a lot of... I think this is one of those cards where it just turns into things over time, where it's like, holy crap, it now combos with this one card that got previewed, and it's nuts. Look at it. it can, you can do all this damage yourself. You mill that many cards. Here's how you do it on turn three. Even if you just have a Kozilek and an Ulamog in your deck? You can never get milled out. You'll just be dumping it into your graveyard and it'll recycle your library. Yeah. Yeah. It's dangerous, though, because they can go, like, mill you most of the way. The Ulamog and Kozilek didn't get there and then kill this thing. Yeah, and, and then you just have no library and you're looking, feeling bad. If you have a Memories Journey or a Croson Reclamation already in a deck and it's got black, Angel of Suffering becomes quite good because those are instant speed flashback ways uh, I see. to save yourself from milling out. Yeah, so this is now looking better in your Sidisi and Modrotha decks because you just talked about Sultai, black, yep. green, and blue. And th- that I can see as the place you'd play a, de- a card like this. Yeah, it's probably like Thassa's Oracle type stuff is what people are really going to do, right? Yeah, and, and I'm sure there's, you know, there's, there's something you can do here that's fun. But for me... Probably not my card. Not my jam. All right, next up we got the... Why? Because bu- of that one Why? bad experience with Hermit Druid? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Body Launderer is next. Two black black for a creature Ogre Rogue. Played against this in draft. It was powerful. It's a 3-3 three, three with Death Touch. Whenever another non-token creature you control dies, Body Launderer connives. When Body Launderer dies, return another target non-rogue creature card with equal, equal or lesser power from your graveyard to the battlefield. So, the idea being you have this out, a non-token creature dies, you're conniving, you're making this a 3-3 three, three to a 4-4 four, four, or 5-5 five, five. and then when this finally dies it's like an 8-8 eight, eight death touch you're bringing back a non-rogue creature with equal or lesser power from a graveyard to the battlefield so you can fetch a lot of stuff out of your graveyard here yeah I think the fetching out of the graveyard is the more interesting part of it the connive's good incidentally um, 
But the fact that when this dies, you can get something out of your graveyard onto the battlefield. Like a Karmic Guide. That seems pretty good. Boy, that seems really good. Yeah, and then you're going to go through your combos. So you got your Blood Artist out, and you're just able to sort of cycle those through. Inf you get infinite enter the battlefield, right? Karmic Guide comes out. Gets Body Launder back. You sack the Karmic Guide, then you sack the Body Launder. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. You got Do that ETBs. again. Yeah. yeah, so you could... That's definitely something I think those decks are already trying to do i know a lot of mardu decks that seems like a good combo for mardu they were trying to do that as well i mean karmic guy just classically does that but here's another card it does that with yep so it's just another sort of piece of a combo any grave crawler s combos will let you loot through your entire deck oh because you're always conniving yeah so you just go you know grave crawler combo you know it dies you with friction alter yeah, 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 dies, yeah, connives, yeah. bring it back dies, connives, bring it back dies, connives. you go through your whole deck find your thoughts oracle or whatever play it Yet another way to Thassa's Oracle, yay. Dockside Extortionist, not a rogue. It can get brought back by the body launderer. How is Dockside Extortionist not a rogue? Uh, it's a goblin, I don't know. It's a goblin pirate. I don't make these rules, I think Josh. it's a goblin pirate. It's definitely a, yeah. It seems like it should be a rogue. He's an extortionist. Mm. Yeah. Maybe he should have been in the brokers, you know? He could, <laughs> why didn't they make him white, black, or I mean white, green, and blue? Why, why not? Why, why not? didn't they do that? All right, so let's move on to the red cards now. All right, the first one is Professional Face Breaker. You gotta love the names. Yep, two in a red for a 2-3 Human Warrior with Menace. Menace. Whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, create a treasure token. Okay. And then says, sacrifice a treasure, exile the top card of your library, you may play that card this turn. Okay, so Wow. The maximum treasure you could get if you hit all three players would be three. Yep. Because it's whenever one or more creatures you control deals combat damage to a player. Yep. But it does turn those treasure into card draw in those instances where you're like, I got a lot of treasure, but nothing to cast. I have seen that happen. Someone, ha I have 15 treasure and two cards in my hand. I, I can't do anything. Now you have 12 to 15 cards off the top of your library that you can play as lands. Uh, this, the second part of this reads like an enchantment to me and yeah. there are enough treasure makers now. Oh God, there's so many. You can actually afford to not use your treasures. Honestly, I, w I might even play this in like Magda because Magda's making tons of treasures. And just a another way to use my treasures. Just another yeah. way to use your treasures. Yeah, you got Zorn, right? Uh, classic. Uh, Academy Manufacturer makes a ton of other things, but Goldspan Dragon, you've got lots of different ways to create treasures just in mono red and then you're doubling the tokens maybe. You're creating even more. You're playing that Dockside Extortionist card that Lynx wants. <laughs> Ragavan, Nimble Pilfer. That this seems great in the Ragavan deck because now you can use something else for your Ragavan to yeah. Let me ask you, do you play Grim Hireling? I don't, but I've seen this card go up a lot and it makes sense. Yeah, so that's three and a black for a three two tiefling rogue. This one's a rogue? Yep. It, yeah, so <laughs> body launderer can't get this back, but it says whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, create two treasure tokens. Two. So this one is sort of the same first text, but you'll get six total if you attack three, the three different players. Yeah. Doesn't have mana, so a little bit harder to get through, but you can pay a black and sacrifice X treasures to give. No, cards. you'll get one, two, three, three for. Oh, if professional, <laughs> yeah, sure. If you have the facebreaker and, and the, the grim hireling, you're making three. Tra yeah, that's I just mean nice. the hireling is in some ways better, in some ways worse. Obviously, makes more treasure, but can't turn the treasure into card draw. Turns the treasure into removal instead. Yeah, um, but that's not good removal. I, I don't like that. Yeah, part of it. Uh, but the the hireling is something we see get played, um, but not a ton. Yep, and it's getting, it, again, these are sorts of cards that just get better over time because more things work with them. Yeah. Uh, and so I think Professional Facebreaker just, not many cards say sack a treasure, do something. And I've seen this happen again. Late game, you make a lot of treasures, you just don't, you lose the gas. And so gas makers and things that turn, even though treasures are already insanely good, just giving them the ability to impulsive card draw, I think is very good. And this also does make treasure. It's got menace and it's a three drop. So yep. most games, you're going to play this on three, and on turn four, it will make you a treasure. Yep. Um, maybe more than one. And sometimes you're going to play this on turn three, have a two drop that can't attack, make a treasure right there. That is very powerful because now it's turning the your other creatures. It sort of has a cryptolith right element to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I just think this all adds up and this is a very, very good card. Yep. And if you're doubling the tokens already, you're just going to get a lot. Uh, the fact that it has menace is just that real nice touch on top to be able to let it, you know, push through for some damage and get you that treasure. Yep. And let's say you keep a sketchy hand, play that on three, hit someone with the treasure, didn't get your land drop. Well, you can dig a little deeper in mono red. 
Next up, we got Structural Assault. Three red red for a sorcery. Destroy all artifacts. Then Structural Assault deals damage to each creature equal to the number of artifacts that are put into graveyards from the battlefield this turn. So this is interesting. This is kind of a pretty good red board wipe. We don't see too many of these. Um, the nice part about this is that you can cast this, someone sacks your treasures in response, but it still counts those treasures as hitting the graveyard this turn, so Structural Assault will still do that damage to people. Um, because it counts it not just from this destroying all artifacts. Yeah, reds, uh, sort of multi-tiered board wipes that hit m different permanent types usually are like lands and creatures. Yeah, this, this one's artifacts, artifacts and, cre and creatures. Yeah. And this is a good chance too on a lot of board states to at least deal five to six damage to every creature on the battlefield, I think. Minimum. Because you're destroying all artifacts, including your own. And this day, there's so many treasure running around. So you you're just likely to just pick up two or three from treasures and then three or four mana rocks. Like, it's hard to imagine when you cast this, you don't get six or seven damage to everything. I like this a lot. Yeah. Um, it's not as good to me as Vandal Blast still, but it's pretty good if you are if you are okay blowing up whatever's on your board. And what you blow up on your board also contributes to the damage you're doing later. Yeah, that's the problem. It doesn't hit opponent's artifacts only. It'd be nice if it said destroy all opponent's artifacts your opponent's control. <laughs> you and wish. then damage was to all creatures. Oh, okay. I think that would kind of have evened it out because five mana is a lot and it has that problem we see with board wipes where... Yeah. You, you do it, and then they get to rebuild first because you use most of your turn because it costs so much mana. Yeah. It's cool, though. You could maybe play this in your Garard deck to return those artifacts to the battlefield or Cosmic uh -oh. Intervention. You could even stack this with Teferi's Protection of sorts. Yeah, you can definitely go uh, play Structural Assault, maintain priority, play Teferi's Protection, let that resolve do, 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 first do, do, time, disappear. gone, boom, blow everything, everything up. up. Gerard's really interesting because... Yeah, because you want Gerard to die. And it'll bring all the stuff back that died for you besides yeah. Gerard. Yeah. Uh, so Gerard... It's definitely going in that deck for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. All right. The All last right. red card we're going to talk about is Unlucky Witness. Just a simple little card. It is one red for a 1-1 one, one human citizen. When it dies, exile the top two cards of your library until your next end step. You may play one of those cards. Play one of one those. One of those cards. Including lands, you can play it. So this kind of reminds me of your black cards that come in, mill you for three, die, mill you for three, uh, the Stitcher Supplier, and there's yeah. another one from, I think, AFR that does a similar thing. So Unlucky Witness is sort of the red version of that. It's a human citizen. You'd probably want to sack this. You're not necessarily going to get someone to block this. Um, you might be able to just hold it there, though, and they're not going to want to attack you. Yeah. Or do they care? Do they care? Maybe. I mean, two cards off the top of your library, and you get to play one until your next end step. So it is... It's still card advantage. You are technically getting a card as, you know... As long as you can play one. You could hit, like, 7-drop, seven 7-drop, seven and it's turn 3, and you can't cast either one. Yeah. That is possible. So it's not, like, 100%. But I think you have a good chance of getting at least a land, and then your unlucky witness just turns into a free land drop for you the next turn that you don't have to draw. Let's imagine this said, when it dies, draw a card. I'm in. No, nah, I don't know. One mana, one, one, when it dies, draw a card. I think that's quite good. Yeah, especially with the amount of Jun Sacrifice and Red Sacrifice yeah. decks that are around. Just everybody now has a deck that touches Sacrifice, right? Like, yeah. it doesn't matter what color you're in, there are some amount of decks that want to sack stuff. Maybe this is good with the Riveteer's Ascendancy, because you can bring oh, this back blood. to the battlefield, sacrifice it. When I sack my Dock side, now I can get back yeah. my unlucky this thing, witness. and at least have something to get back. Unfortunately, when, when you sack the Unlucky Witness, nothing, it doesn't get anything back, because there are no zero. Oh, um, won't. Well, well, you could get like a, a walking ballista because it's zero mana. Sure, but and you then also it, just sack it for value. Yeah, and, and you know sack the walking ballista else, would die. Like. By the way, so yeah. you're doing the impact tremors perforos thing with that. Then I think there's just going to be a, a generally a, a lot of uses where this is pretty good, and it doesn't cost you much to put in your deck, and will just mm -hmm. provide value when your other engines are already going. Yeah, yeah, interesting yeah. stuff. I like it. Okay, next up we got uh, green cards, and this one is the subject of a lot of debate. It is the Bootlegger's Stash. Five also and, overrated. Yeah, five and green for an artifact. Lands you control have tap, create a treasure token. I do agree. I think this is overrated. Oh my gosh, Jimmy, we need to ban this card. It's crazy. Yeah, we do not need to ban this card. It's six mana, uh, and also the lands you spend tapping it do not tap you for treasures that turn. It's so. It, yeah, it's six mana, and it doesn't do anything by itself really and especially the turn you play it it doesn't do anything unless yeah. you have lands left over and even if you do what do you do tap those for treasure then what do you do with those treasure use them well you could have just tapped the lands for that <laughs> so it really doesn't do anything 
until the following turn when you untap, and even then it doesn't do anything. Yeah, you have to wait. Are we going to do past your turn, wait till your end step? And Create then, the treasure, don't or, use them? Well, I mean, here's the thing. You can tap to cast spells, and now you have treasure, so it's like it's doubling your mana, but guess what? Green has tons of cards that do this and double your mana. And they double it now, you know, faster, where this is like tap, make the treasure, wait until my next turn, untap, now I have double mana. Yeah. Obviously, with synergies, it becomes very good, but so <laughs> many cards are good with synergies, right? Yeah, Academy Manufacturer obviously is the big one now your lands tap for three artifacts each time i don't know play time sieve or something and any manufacturer man that card we mentioned it a lot yeah zoran goldspan dragon these are cards you're gonna see i think a lot of because just because treasures just get better and better parallel uh, lives anointed procession doubling season all the normal token stuff you play those before you play this but that sounds great but think of what you've done on turn four i did nothing <laughs> on turn six I did nothing. Now it's turn seven. I untap. I'm about to go off. But you're probably dead because you took two important turns and played something that didn't affect anybody in any way. It or was someone just, just blew up one of those things yeah. and, and then you feel really, really bad. Uh, yeah, we then don't... you go bootlegger stats. They go in response, chain of vapor, <laughs> your parallel lives. Crap. Yeah, we've seen this with fire emancipation. It's like, wow, it's so cool. It does so much. It's like, if it gets blown up and you spent your whole turn doing it, well, it feels really bad. Like, it's like Nick's Bloom Ancient. That's why you don't really see it have a huge impact. I love that uh, example. That's the one I keep using. Yeah, that, I, Nick's I Blue follow Matrix. you on Twitter, I think. That's where is I got it, it from. Would you say, which is more powerful? Bootlegger Stash, Nick's Blue Ancient. I would say Nick's Blue Ancient. I would too. Now, how often do we see Nick's Blue Ancient? Almost never, surprisingly. Not that often. So, by that logic, Bootlegger Stash is going to be way overblown. We're not going to see it very much. Because if it's not as good as a card, we already don't see that much. Yeah. It does a very similar thing. Just trying to give you a bunch of mana. Yeah. So, here's the thing. You have to be able to either power this thing out, I think, really quickly. And then, for somehow, have a bunch of extra land drops that you can turn into treasures. And then you need to do something with those treasures, too. So, there's like a, a few steps to make this good. I think it looks very flashy, but it's actually not fantastic. Yep. All right. For now, maybe there's a card in the future that breaks it with your reckless fire weaver. Is that, you know? I think we need a lot more like ways to cheat artifacts out sp specifically because Nyx Bloom is a lot better because there's a lot more creature graveyard creature recursion. Creature cheating, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. harder to cheat an artifact in play. Not impossible, especially in green, but it's just way more hoops. I just don't think it's ultimately going to be very good. Yeah. All right. This next card is pretty good, though. And it is the Buy a Box promo nice. from uh, the set. It is Gala Greeters. It's one and a green for a 1 1. Elf Druid has Alliance, so we're calling this Creature Fall. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, choose one that hasn't been chosen this turn. You can either put a 1-1 counter on Gallagreeters, create a tapped treasure token, or gain two life. Okay, so you can only do this three times if you have three creatures in the battlefield. Sure, but three creatures entering the battlefield during your turn is... I mean, that's good. You had a good turn if you did you that. You had a good turn, and you did three kind of cool things. Uh, I don't know. I don't really care so much about this card josh yeah the treasure token alone yeah but it's tapped so that does make it a little bit worse um i think the fact that you could obviously pair this up with your instant speed makers and all that stuff is nice um the gaining two life though uh, not actually that bad there is like i think it's shoddy offshoot it's like landfall gain life and yeah those, and that can and add up the soul sisters they do count your opponent so this is not the exact same thing yeah but yeah just gaining 10 to 12 extra life in a game does have a tendency to affect the outcome yeah, yeah. um yeah, so I, I, and this is a two drop, so I like the fact that it, it's all going to add up over time. I do think like every time I play a creature, I get a treasure. Yes, I can't use it till next turn, but that's a one mana rebate on um, all my creatures. creatures. And if I, it's not every creature, I guess, because if you play two in a turn, you don't get that. But the fact that you still get a little bonus, I don't know, for two mana, it just this seems... reminds me of like Prosperous Innkeeper. That yeah. Gives you a treasure when it's the battlefield and does the life gain thing, but maybe a little better because you... Treasures are better. Yeah. And, and you could also do it three times a turn with Cabal and with these guys and you can get something different each time. So interesting. Yeah. I like the card. I think it's quite good. I guess I like two drops. Yeah. Well, this is another two drop in green you might like. It's called Boxing Ring. It's one in the green for an artifact. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, it fights up to one target creature you uh -oh. don't control with the same mana value. And then you can tap this to create a treasure token and activate only if you control a creature that fought this turn. So if you get a creature in, it instantly fights something, but it has to fight a creature with the same mana value they don't control. Because weight classes. Weight classes, yeah. It's have to be in its weight That's class. That's a good yeah. point. And then ding, 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 it's over. Tap, you make a treasure. If you've survived the fight, then you get paid for the fight. Actually, even if you don't survive you the fight, the purse. yeah, you could fight a 1-1 against a 10-10 and you still have a creature that fought this turn. Oh, no. No, you have to control it. 
Uh, so it has uh, to have survived. It doesn't have to have won the fight. It could have a draw. But a winner or a draw and it gets paid. That's true. If you, yeah, because when it fights, the fighting thing is that it does the damage to each other. And then if it dies, you no longer control a creature that fights this turn. So you have to win or draw. Yeah. Uh, the flavor's amazing, right? Yeah. You have to fight something within your weight class and then you get paid for the fight if you win or draw. Uh, not actually that useful yeah i mean let's say you're doing the cool thing which is a death touch creature that fights well i'm sorry but it's probably it's a one one it's gonna die when it comes in and does the fight thing and it has to fight a creature with equal mana value really hampers it i think if it could fight any creature then all of a sudden like all your green creatures become removal spells for smaller stuff yeah that would make it a lot more playable probably would have to cost more mana because that wouldn't feel fair but the fact that it's like, uh, you have to match the mana value up means there often won't be a target and when there, there'll more often be a point where it won't win that fight. Yeah, it is kind of cool that you are going to at least be able to, you know, it's like a token killer maybe. Your one one's coming and kill another one one all the time, but you don't get to tap to make the treasure token. But there are fight tribal decks now. So Kogla, the Titanate, Ayula, Queen Among Bears, Nyeth of the Dire Hunt, if you want to go more than one color. There are cards that are like, hey, let's start fighting. Fight tribal. And Boxing Ring seems like the right card to put in there. There's Grothama and stuff, too. You can yeah. fight stuff in. So there, there are ways to get this card going. It's, I just like the flavor. I don't think it's actually that good. Yeah. It is in set boosters only, though, we should say. Oh, right, right. All right, the next one is Scheming Fence. We're on to Multicolor, and we only got one card here. It's a two-drop, and I also like this card, so maybe <laughs> it is a thing. All right, it is uh, white and a blue, so two mana for a 2-3 human citizen. As Scheming Fence enters the battlefield, you may choose a non-land permanent. Uh-huh. Activated abilities of the chosen permanent can't be activated. Scheming Fence has all activated abilities of the chosen permanent except for loyalty abilities. You may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to activate those abilities. Okay, so this is like, hey, I want my own soul ring. Well, I would rather steal somebody else's soul ring. Yeah, yeah, turn, yeah. Turn it off. Turn it off, and then you get the soul ring ability. Right, so if they've got a soul ring or mana crypt, this is pretty bad. You go boom. Your soul ring doesn't work. Mm-hmm. I can tap this now for two mana. Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. It's the white blue stacksy type of thing, but it's shutting down one. It could be a very powerful thing. Maybe they're trying to go infinite with Basalt Monolith or Mana Vault or whatever it is. Oh, and it's great. It doesn't get the rest of the text. It only gets the activated abilities, so it oh, will yeah. untap as normal. Oh, okay. Here's the thing, though. You cannot tap at the turn that comes in, so that is a bit of a bummer. Yep. Because it's a creature. It's not an artifact. It's just stealing one away. But we do know how powerful uh, a lot of activated abilities can be. So it's a non-land permanent. It doesn't need to be an artifact. It could be their Captain Sisse deck, so they can't search out anymore. Kenrith. Oh, shutting down Kenrith. And he gets all the abilities, and you can spend mana of any color. Yeah. Yo, Kenrith is like the perfect person to target with the scheming boyo. Krenko. It does turn off Planeswalkers. It just can't activate their abilities, so that's nice. I think, though, the fact that there's this proliferation of mana rocks, and we see so many two mana rocks, is what makes this so good, because in a worse... white blue deck, too. Yeah, you're getting ramp out of this thing, and shutting off somebody else's ramp Mm -hmm. uh, will probably be 80% of the time. Now, you can obviously do Krenkos and whatever sometimes, but not every game do people play things that have activated abilities, but every game, somebody's playing mana rocks, right? I'm going to play this in my Lagrella the Magpie deck, so that you can come back in and choose something else the next time. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, turn off one thing, exile another thing they get something else scary out okay i'll blink I'll reset this stuff and, yeah. and get the better stuff yeah i think this this card is quite good okay cool i can dig it all right this all card right. this is the one post malone was the most excited about when we talked to him but it wasn't a commander card so we couldn't really talk about it on that live episode <laughs> so this is a legendary artifact equipment it's luxior giada's gift or giada's gift it's a one mana legendary artifact equipment it says equipped creature gets plus one plus one for each counter on it that's right equipped pr- equipped permanent isn't a planeswalker and is a creature in addition to its other types equip planeswalker one mana and equip a regular creature three so any counter this includes loyalty counters on planeswalker it only costs one to equip and then it turns the planeswalker into a creature like gideon typically does he goes into creature mode yeah except you can do this on any planeswalker now for two mana one mana oh yeah you pay it for one equip for one that's nuts uh so here's some rule stuff because it says it isn't a planeswalker so if you equip this to a planeswalker your opponent can't attack the planeswalker anymore because it's not a planeswalker anymore Oh, so yeah, that's right. They can't attack. Yeah, yeah, it's not so illegal. So it turns it into a creature. Card. However, it can still activate its loyalty abilities because that is not, you don't have to be a planeswalker to activate your abilities, yep. right? Um, and then it also gets plus one, plus one if you go plus up with yep. uh, for each counter you got in there, yeah. 
if the planeswalker is dealt damage in like combat through attacking or blocking, it doesn't lose its loyalty counters because it's not a planeswalker. Because it's not a planeswalker, it's a creature. Oh, it so just it has just keeps the yeah. So it could be like a six six. You hit it for five. It's still a six six. Yeah. It's next, it's gonna just like any creature. The damage will be marked on it. Then the next turn, and the damage will go away. Okay. It same same goes with burn, lightning bolts, things like that. You don't get to hit it with a lightning bolt. Take out th- off three loyalty counters. Right now, it does have the downside that damage that is above. Uh, or equal, equal to. to its toughness will kill it just like any other creature. So if yep. it's a 6-6 six, six, and they block it with their 7-7, seven, seven, it will die. It will die. Yeah. But still, this is a pretty good way because I think one of the downsides and why we just don't see very many Planeswalkers get played is they just so easily... So often you play it, you activate it once, and the table just goes, no... I'm going to, we're yeah. going to work together. We're going to kill that thing. And they're like, get a blocker out of the way. Then you attack Liar, it. Yeah, yeah whatever. So Planeswalkers just tend to be very bad unless you're playing a Planeswalker dedicated deck that has a lot of support built around them. But like one or two Planeswalkers in a deck is just usually bad because your your deck's not set up for it. I don't know if this goes in those decks because you, you don't really want to equip this to a normal creature. Maybe if you have a counter deck or something like that. Yeah, if you're like ozolithing something up to make something really big. I think this is nice with Planeswalker is that let's say you do have an ability that makes the Planeswalker go to zero or very close to it. You can use that and then you can throw on like a regular, like a, a vigilance counter or a uh, shield counter. Which and is then, an anthem effect. Yeah, and then now all of a sudden that Planeswalker, even if it takes its loyalty to zero, it's got another random counter on it. It's going to be at least a 1-1. One, one. So th- there is back. an interesting way to, yeah, maybe there's a way to keep your Planeswalkers around, especially if they have those enchantment-like abilities. Ashiok Dream Render, Nest, Narset Parter of Veils, um, Karn the Great Creator. Those are all very powerful cards. Kiora, Behemoth Beckoner, is a 7 loyalty Planeswalker. It's a 7-7. Seven, seven. Yeah, these are cards that you just want their static ability yeah so what you you're just trying to put this on to that to make it tougher to get rid of man ashiok with this on is the most annoying thing nobody can tutor yeah right? no and one it's can, hard to kill hard it to kill and you it. can't tutor for the thing to kill it so you're a lot of decks are just turned off by that i think to fairy master of time really good with this on it because it's going to tick up every single turn and get huge be hard to kill yeah yeah i i think this card is quite good with planeswalkers that are commanders mm-hmm. because most of those decks don't want their commanders to die right if you got aminatu or estrid or something like that right Boom, put this on there and it's like oh great crap it's yeah. way harder to get they, rid of yeah oh gosh i can't attack it separately it just sits as a creature i have to board wipe now to kill it like everything else yeah there's also an infinite combo with devoted druid because devoted druid you tap to add a minus one minus one counter okay. to it and you untap it however luxior makes it so that that minus one minus one counter is uh, balanced out by it gets plus one plus one for a counter on it so it's a net zero each time so you can continue to tap Devoted Druid, put a million minus one minus one counters on it, and then make a million green mana. Yeah. Uh, Devoted Druid turns out pretty good card. And in one of the precons, too. Yeah. No less. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. pretty sweet. Uh, yeah. So I think this card, limited usage. I, I, you have to have enough Planeswalkers, or you have to be in a counter heavy deck because this doesn't have to go on Planeswalkers. And so yeah. it's going to be quite good if you're able to put. But it is very you know, good. Or something. When it jumps onto a Planeswalker, it's pretty sweet what it does. It's definitely going to make it so people are like, okay, I got that under control. Then they put this on and you're like, uh oh. Uh, how do I get rid of it now? Now the Narset's out there. It's hard to. It's harder to kill or not as easy as I was going to. And they're definitely going to windfall and now we're dead. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Welcome to okay. playing against Cassius. Welcome to playing against Cassius. Nice, nice. Okay, what's up next? The next one is called Threefold Signal. This is another card that's only available in the set boosters. It's a three mana artifact. When it uh, enters the battlefield, you scry three, and then each spell you cast that's exactly three colors oh. has replicate three. That means when you cast the spell, copy it for each time you paid its replicate replicate cost. You may choose new targets for the copies. A copy of a permanent spell becomes a token. So if you play a three a, a spell that's exactly three colors. Mm-hmm. For as many times as you have left over three mana, you can copy that spell. Okay, that's a lot of mana, but there's probably some crazy things you can copy. Yeah. Here's the thing. When I saw this card, I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be crazy. Posty and I were texting each other literally because he was like, can you Jessica's will this thing? And it's like, no. No. Three colors. And then so we, you know, you get in uh, to online and you start looking up like what spells exist in exactly three colors. There's some, but there's just not that many. 
And mm -hmm. like, how many three color spells do you have to have in your deck before you would think about playing this card? If your win con is a, a three color spell, the first card we have here is like villainous wealth. So instead of playing X is equal to eight plus three, you do X is equal to five plus three, but then you're only getting two triggers of villainous wealth. You're getting, getting 10, 10 instead, instead of, of eight. eight. And actually you want X to be higher because that counts for the mana, the mana cost, cost that you're allowed yeah. to cast. Yeah, ooh. Yeah, so you're, it, it, that's more relevant if you're like, Villainous Wealth for 20. So, you, okay, 17, do that twice, 34. I'm kind of off this card. I don't think I like it anymore. <laughs> uh, also, three mana Scry 3 is not that great, unless you're flickering it a bunch in the Brago deck or something. But mm. then you're in the Brago deck. That's a two-color deck. Yeah. Oh, no. I mean, there's some Jeskai's Ascendancy, like having two or three of those out could get nuts, right? Every time I would cast a spell, I True. untap a creature you would three times. imagine, though, that Jeskai's Ascendancy by itself should win you the game at that point, too. If you're, you're playing that deck that really uses it, right? Are you limited by not having more than one Jeskai's Ascendancy? Are you playing Mirror Maid in that deck to duplicate it, too? Yeah, good point. I don't know. Uh, Whirlwind of Thought, maybe? Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, draw a card. Having two or three of those might be good. But that's seven mana to play every time you cast a non-creature spell, draw two cards. Okay, hold on. Magister Sphinx. Oh! That's a player's life yeah, total to I'm 10. In. I'm in. So you go, Magic or Sphinx, if I have 7, 10, 13 mana, everybody's, all my opponents are set to 10. Yeah. If I have 13 mana, I could probably just kill them, but... The problem with this is that, one, <laughs> you could just flicker Magic or Sphinx instead. Good point, and, or and just reanimate Also reanimate it, but you cannot reanimate it with the threefold signal because you have to replicate. You have to, it's on, on cast, so... Uh, Wargate? Okay, yeah, there's a new combo deck in, uh, I think, Modern and Legacy that use Wargate. Um, yeah, but I don't then, think they're going to play through full signal. But. Oh my gosh, you're paying, what, you're paying seven mana to get two one-drops? You're paying... <laughs> uh, yep, when you put it like that, it's not as good. Yeah. The amount of mana you have to have to make three-fold signal good is prohibitive. And also just, we're naming all the best cards that have three colors. I mean, there's the ultimatums, but a lot of them aren't any good if you double them because they're like bring all creatures back or yeah who cares about destroy doubling. all things it doesn't matter if you do that twice like, i like yeah. someone uh, you, someone put lord xander the collector on here so for 10 mana you get two lord xanders one enters and dies so you, you know maybe that's sure i don't know sure. scrying three just is play. not good enough to just play the artifact by itself too and so that makes me very uh, about the whole thing okay fine i okay. was excited when i originally saw it but i came to the same conclusion you did which is it's not good it three mana is just a lot. Yeah. If it was like three mana and you could, I don't know, convoke it or do something else to reduce the cost or, it, you know, you can reduce it just by other means, maybe then you're looking at something interesting. Like you could training grounds or something. For right. It or whatever. Okay. Uh, the last things we're going to talk about are first these interesting... Uh, out overlook lands hideouts hideout. storefronts yeah. yeah they're, they're not hideaway hideout yeah they're hideouts so like the brokers hideout we'll read these are just common lands here uh they're interesting uh we'll talk a little bit about them it says when brokers hideout enters the battlefield sacrifice it when you do search your library for a basic forest plains or island card put it on the battlefield tapped and then shuffle and you gain one life so this is a fixing card you can play it it'll instantly sacrifice you'll get a land on the battlefield that's two landfall triggers for what it's worth but you do uh, this takes a land slot in your deck, and typically that land slot, if it was like for a basic land, now this is actually taking that place. It also is restrictive for no apparent reason. Like, compare this to Evolving Wilds. There's obviously one of these for each family. Yeah, so it's like, oh, cool, I need to choose at this point. I need a Plains or whatever. But it is, uh, unfortunately, is, yeah, Evolving Wilds just does the same thing. Minus the gain of life. Yeah, and it doesn't, I mean... I guess if you're in like a Maestro's of Grixis deck, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and you play the Maestro's one, that's the same as in Evolving Wilds, basically. Except, here's the thing you can't choose when to sacrifice yeah. the Maestro's Theater. When I play it, it forces me to sacrifice it at that moment and go make my choice. And there are times when Evolving Wilds. Uh, is better than that. Urborg's out or something like that. You have uh, Maya's out. Um, right. Or there's you're waiting for a landfall trigger or something like that. You've got some reason that you want to sequence your Evolving Wilds or your Fetch Land to not sacrifice right now. These don't do that. So yeah. I think in general, like if you're already running Evolving Wilds and Terramorphic Expanse then and you're in exactly these three colors maybe mm -hmm. but they're pretty bad yeah these are for limited uh so yeah. you can you can play other colors so i wouldn't look to these you've got plenty of other budget and very affordable and very accessible options to try and fix your mana however there are some lands that you should pick up yeah so they finished the triome cycle from uh Ikoria. Ikoria. there's Zeator's proving ground rafine's tower xander's lounge jetmir's garden and spara's headquarters and one for each family Obscura, Maestros, etc. They are the Triumphs, though. They have land types. So, for example, Spar's Headquarters has land types Forest Plains Island. It can tap to add green, white, or blue. It comes into the battlefield, taps, but it has Cycling 3. Um, you got to pick these up 
now, between now and like the next couple of months, when they're going to be the lowest price they're ever going to be for at least the next couple of years. We've just seen already what the Triumphs are doing price-wise. These are going to do the same thing. Yep. They have three basic land types on each of them. They're incredibly fetchable, even by cards that aren't the fetch land. So you can find ways to grab these out of your deck with myriad landscape with all sorts of things and even like you know if you do have a fetch land cracking this on ends up getting a tapped three color land on the battlefield is very good yeah you can't do it with myriad landscape only basics and two of the same oh i'm sorry but, yeah my, my bad yeah but fetch regular fetch lands can definitely go get it yeah and, and there I'm, are a lot of cards that will say get two forests out you yeah know, wood elves and things like that yeah that get and forest then guys. you can grab like a swamp mountain forest that's pretty good when you need to fix your mana past you know one or two colors i mean i've seen people two with colors. cdh decks running these so they don't think they're too slow because they come in tapped uh they like the advantage of triple land types the ability to cycle yeah you rarely cycle them i think yeah. most it's really just that you can fetch them up with a lot of different things and it's fixing three colors every mana at once so pick I, them up i have a question about these jimmy yeah why did they get so cute with the name of them oh, like <laughs> why isn't it obscura triome like why do I have to have some... It's like Sparta's, Sparta's Headquarters. Which one's that again? <laughs> I, they could have done this also for the ones from Ikoria. It's just name them Grixis, whatever. Or Sorry, it would have been yeah. Jeff Guy, whatever. You know, just so it'd be easier for us to... Like, I play a, you know... I don't know, Obscure Headquarters. Yep. Okay, I know exactly what that is. But I play Spara's Headquarters. It's like, okay. Who's Spara? And yep. yeah, when am I fetching out with this one? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, th these names are very cute. My question to you is, where would you hang out if you had the choice? Let's see. Probably whatever one's a cabaretty, right? Because they party. I mean, Jetmere's Garden is pretty nice, too. Yeah, that looks nice. I don't want to go to... The Rafine's Tower is a no-no. This is dark things are happening uh, I'm going to get pushed off of the Rafine's Tower. Yeah. The Zeator's Proving Ground, man, they're going to beat me up. Or you could be watching a cool fight. Xander's Lounge looks okay, but I have the feeling they're going to fatten me up so they can suck, drink my blood. Yeah, you also know Xander, and he's yeah, not he's, a nice guy. I don't guy. want to hang out with him. Yeah, it's... Jemir's Garden or Spara's Headquarters. Spara's Headquarters if you want to do like a touristy check out the, oh, look at the... Take pictures front. of the church. Yeah. It looks like I'm in Italy for Jet sure. Jemir's Garden is like, I want to hang out with some animals. Yeah, I'm going to pet like a, a dog and a cat and I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a party and eat some good food at Jemir's Garden. I'm going there. Okay, yeah, me too. All right. All right. <laughs> Speaking of questions, Jimmy, we've now covered all the cards we're uh -huh. talk about from the set. So now we need to ask the, the big questions here that we always, the hard hitting questions. The hard hitting questions, yeah. At Command Zone. I've narrowed it down to this, but let me know if you agree. Yeah. We're, uh, we always ask what we think is the most powerful new card from a set. And then we always ask what we think is our favorite new card from a set. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Okay. Um, so. so most powerful. <sighs> oh boy, this is It's a tough one. It. Cause I don't think there's a gimme. There's no gimme. There's definitely a few cards in con competition. I think I have my vote for what I think is the most powerful card. All right. We'll say at the same time like we always do. Most powerful card, three, two, one. Riveteer's, Riveteer's Ascendancy. Ascendancy. Wow, agree. nice. It, there's just so much combo potential here. Yeah. And it's black, green, red. It's already doing this. This is the easiest one to play in those decks. But the other two close ones were both blue. Uh, Ledger Shredder was almost a decision by me and even the score. But these are both enemy dependent. So I'm not as hot on it as a result. All right, so let's do favorite new card. I'll give you a little bit of time to look through. Don't forget these three over here. Oh, right, right. I already right. know, and I pretty much gave it away when we yeah, were doing the review. Yeah, you made me what talk about favorite. it for like an hour. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So mine's an easy pick, but you can think about it for a minute. Don't forget about uh, Body Launder over oh, here. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's also uh, the Fight Club. That yeah, boxing. Fight, boxing ring. Yeah. Probably not going to choose threefold, whatever. What's it called? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what you got? Manifold key, whatever. Threefold signal. Threefold signal. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think I got it. Okay. All right. Uh, well, mine, I'll just do, and we don't have to say it at the same time, just so it's not confusing. Uh, Ledger Shredder is yeah, my favorite, and the one so. I'm most excited about. Yeah. I'm kind of in the same world with Rumor Gatherer. Uh -huh. I think this is a great card for white. I even, when I drafted it, when I drafted it, I was like, this is amazing. I can't wait to have this in draft too. So yeah. it seems really good. It's definitely the kind of card that the white, right? Like now I think the white mono, mono white weenie token deck, it is viable. You can do an angel version. You can do a soldier version. There's so many cards now that you can play in those decks that can get you close to, but not on the full same level as others. But you know, you're white. You've got your own advantages there too. Yeah, I think uh, we've been talking about it for a number of years, and we can start talking about it less probably now. Yep. They've made enough white cards, and I like Rumor Gatherer where it sits. We always said, hey, listen, we don't need a lot of Smothering Tithe or Teferi's Protection level stuff. We need more Smothering Tithe. Yeah, what we need is more Cultivate level stuff, and I yeah. feel like Rumor Gatherer, Welcoming Vampire, a number of cards over the last few years yep. have uh, been at that power level. So there's a lot more like mid-level staples for white, which I like. Yep. 
Okay, to the listeners, what is your favorite card from Streets of New Commander in the 99? What, what, what decks is it going in? Are you going to play Luxier in your deck? How are you going to use it and uh, make it super cool and have everyone look at you and go, wow, you're so cool. Wow, that's why you play Magic is for us to tell you how cool you are with what you just did with that equipment in your Planeswalker. Amazing! Let us know in the comments. You can tweet at us as well, but there's tons of discussion that always happens in our YouTube comments. It's always great to see. We scroll through, we check it out, uh, and it's, it's awesome just seeing everyone interacting and being positive and being excited about cards because that's why we're here too. We didn't even talk about Luxier, Giada's Gift, and uh, Helm of the Host combo. Jeez. Oh, Helm. Okay. How are people going to get excited if Helm they don't know about Helm of the Host that? combo. Wanna, By the way, the, the, the copy combo. is a Planeswalker. It's not a creature. So, But uh, it still doesn't care about the Legendary. Yeah, yeah, All right. Uh, before we go, we got to talk about our sponsors. Channelfireball.com slash command. We just talked about a ton of awesome new cards from Streets of New Capenna. You know you want to get Ledger Shredders. Triumphs. You want to put them into your deck. Oh, Triumphs for sure. If you're going to buy draft boosters, set boosters, collector boosters, Channel Fireball literally is the best place to go to get sealed products. Yeah. That is a thing they specialize in because all of the vendors on their site are licensed businesses. They're LGSs. So they have great, they have access to great prices on their sealed products because they go straight through the, the distributor. But they also have a bunch of singles from the set because mm -hmm. they crack open the boxes and, you know, they're local game stores. So if you want to pre order specific cards, which is really the best way to go if you know what you want to build, yeah. um, then. Again, channelfireball.com slash command. Their marketplace really is the, the new the new best spot to buy your magic cards. All right. Also, Ultra Pro. New shop online. Shop.ultrapro.com slash command. Here's something that is that we don't talk about very much on the belt Ultra Pro is that they own the rights to also a lot of other franchises yeah. to put on the products like Pokemon and a lot of things that you recognize. And they also just create tons of just like blank sleeves. So if you're like a board game enthusiast, mm. they will have sleeves that match either the small, tiny like resource cards or the bigger cards. And Look, I'm not going to lie. It's kind of nerdy to sleeve up the cards in a board game. But when you do and you're able to shuffle it and actually use it, like it feels great. Yeah. So Ultra Pro creates products for not just Magic, but for a lot of your gaming needs. Uh, check out their store online, shop.ultrapro.com slash command. Use our affiliate link and just buy stuff. There's so much good stuff there. There's stuff that they have deals on from the past, stuff that maybe they couldn't sell from a set that, bam, you can get for a great deal. And you can also go to your local game store as well to support. Yep. Uh, and, and before we go, wanted to once again mention that we are going to be attending Command Fest Las yeah, Vegas. Yeah, get there. Yep, June 10th through the 12th. Jimmy and I, along with many members from the Command Zone team, are going to be in Las Vegas at the Convention Center, hanging out, looking for games with everybody else who's there. So uh, if you've ever wanted to sit down and, and beat us up, I know a lot of people want to come and do that every time we yeah. go to those. Hey, that'll be your chance. Bring it. I'm Bring definitely going to stroll the, the halls and buy from the vendors, too. It's one of my yep. favorite things to do, trading and stuff. Oh, lots of opportunities will be there. So hopefully we'll get to see you there. And it's Vegas. So there's really good food. Yeah. There's awesome things to do outside of the convention hall. You know, the crap stable is always calling us. So yeah, there's a <laughs> yeah. lot of hangouts that happened, not just meeting us, but meeting other content creators and just thousands of other commander players will go to this thing. It's a great way to sort of meet people. Play um, in people's hotels rooms. Like yeah. the magic continues throughout the night. I love at the end of the convention, you walk through, it's 3 a.m. Everyone's just on the ground outside of yeah. the hotels. They're all seeing, saying hi, bye to each other and playing their final commander games. It's such a treat. We have friends that we've known and continue to be friends friends with lifelong friends that we met at these at these uh events so yeah definitely worth going to again that's command fest las vegas the 10th through the 12th of june but there are other command fest going around if uh you can't attend that one yeah, check the list out yeah there's probably one in your area all right big thanks to our amazing team here at the command zone we have damon lens sean gillis arthur meadowcroft lash ashlyn rose lady danger manson lung craig blanchett josh murphy jake boss patrick nandrum bridging sam wall the goliath truck tie jamie block mitch trafford and evan limberger woohoo Ooh, you did that very fast. Yeah, especially thanks. I want I'm done. I'm gonna get me out of here. <laughs> it's a long episode. Yeah, these always are. I need it's to also pee. like uh, almost eight o'clock, and yeah, everybody else yeah. went home. Yeah, special <laughs> thanks, Jeffrey Balmer, killing it on Twitter right now at Living Cards MTG. And uh, you know what? Uh, that's it. That's it. I'm done talking. Okay, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us. That'll do it for our Streets of New Capanna coverage. We'll be back very, very soon talking about Commander Ledger's Legends Baldur's Gate. So make sure you hit the subscribe uh, button and get the notifications. All right, I'll let Jimmy go pee now. I should just keep talking. No, 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 Jimmy. No, no. I said well, wait. Hold on. I got one more question. Okay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thanks, Crackling everybody. Crackling <laughs> Doom. That's a three man, three color card you can play with that yeah. stupid freaking. Oh, Lava Lanch is a pretty good one. Signal. Too, Fates of Black. It's a player. So. Fates of Black. <laughs>
Greetings, humans. <laughs>